Good evening and welcome to the May 9th, 2023 edition of the Downers Grove Village Council. Uh, Mayor Barnett is off researching the origins of Woo Pig Suey, so I will be filling in as uh, the Mayor Pro Tem tonight. Uh, would you all please rise and join us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody. Rosa, could we have a roll call, please? Mayor Barnett. Commissioner Jose. Here. Commissioner Sadowski Fugit. Here. Commissioner Gilmartin. Here. Commissioner Glover. Here. Commissioner Tully. Here. Commissioner Davenport. Here. Thank you. Item three on our agenda is <clears throat> proclamations. We have two this evening. We'll start with a proclamation with regard to Mental Health Awareness Month. Whereas Mental Health Awareness Month has been observed in the United States since 1949, and whereas Mental Health Awareness Month is recognized in Downers Grove to enhance local awareness of mental health issues, start discussions, and highlight the many resources available in our community, and whereas every day millions of people face stigma related to mental health and may feel isolated and alone, and whereas two out of every five people report symptoms of anxiety or depression and even more care for someone who is experiencing symptoms and whereas creating a community where everyone feels comfortable reaching out for the support they deserve is crucial to ending the stigma around mental health and whereas promoting mental health and wellness leads to higher overall productivity better educational outcomes lower crime rates stronger economies and improved quality of life and whereas the village of downers grove its village council and boards and commissions wish to fulfill their responsibility in promoting mental wellness and whereas assistance is available 24 hours a day seven days a week through the suicide and crisis lifeline at 988 and dupage crisis services at 630-627-1700 now therefore robert t barnett mayor of the village of downers grove does hereby proclaim may 2023 as mental health awareness month in the village of downers grove to enhance community awareness of mental health and let all residents know mental health matters and you matter here in Downers Grove. Dated this 9th day of May, 2023 at Downers Grove, Illinois. And I understand we have some folks with us to uh, accept the proclamation. Oh, I, Bill, I, I think. Oh, I could. <laughs> <laughs> Our second proclamation is for National Bike Month. Whereas National Bike Month was established in 1956 and serves as an annual opportunity to showcase the many benefits of bicycling and encourage more folks to giving biking a try. And whereas the Downers Grove Bicycle Club works year round promoting the joys and benefits of bicycling in Downers Grove and throughout the area. And whereas the Downers Grove Bike Club, the League of American Bicyclists, schools, park and recreation districts, public health officials, hospitals, companies, and other civic groups, promotion of bicycling improves public awareness of safe bicycle operation, reducing collisions, injuries, and fatalities, 
improving health and safety for everyone. And whereas, throughout the month of May, the residents of Downers Grove are invited to join in Bike to Work Week, May 15th through the 21st. The Downers Grove Bike Club's participation in the annual Ride of Silence on May 17th, honoring cyclists injured or killed while riding, and Bike to Work Day on Friday, May the 19th. And whereas, Downers Grove's quiet streets attract bicyclists each year, providing an economical, healthy, convenient, and environmentally sound form of transportation, and an excellent tool for recreation, exploration, and enjoyment of Downers Grove's beauty. And whereas, cycling's low-impact form of exercise can help protect riders from stroke, heart attack, depression, diabetes, obesity, and arthritis. And whereas, creating a bicycling-friendly community has been shown to improve citizens' health, well-being, and quality of life, to boost community spirit, to improve traffic safety, and to reduce pollution and congestion and growing the economy of Downers Grove. Now therefore, Robert T. Barnett, Mayor of the Village of Downers Grove, does hereby proclaim May 2023 as National Bike Month in the Village of Downers Grove and urges all residents to join in seeking opportunities to ride and enjoy this special observance of biking in our community. Dated this ninth day of May 2023, at Downers Grove, Illinois. And Bill, uh, would you and, and members of the Bicycle Club join us, please? Four on our agenda is the minutes. Do we have a motion with regard to the minutes? Mayor Pro Tem, I move to approve the Village Council meeting minutes from May 2nd, 2023 as presented. Second. Any discussion on the minutes? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. That brings us to item five, our consent agenda. Is there a motion? Mayor Pro Tem, I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Any public comment with regard to the consent agenda? Rosa, could I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Sadowski Fugit? Aye. Commissioner Gilmartin? Aye. Commissioner Davenport? Aye. Commissioner Tully? Aye. Commissioner Glover? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Jose? Aye. That matter passes unanimously. We have no active agenda tonight, so that brings us to item seven, our first reading. Uh, this is an opportunity for the council to see items for the first time and an opportunity for the public to weigh in uh, on these items as well as the council. Um, so I will turn it over to village manager Dave Fieldman for the presentations. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. There are five items on tonight's first reading agenda. The first is an ordinance considering uh, authorizing a special use for the property at 2539 Ogden. And here to present background information on this petition 
is our Community Development Director, Stan Popovich. Thank you, Mr. Fieldman. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and Fellows Council members. Today, Fieldman notes special use for a uh, personal vehicle repair and maintenance facility at 2530 and Avenue. As you are aware, special uses are uses that are allowed in the zoning district. Is they are generally appropriate for the area, but may require special regulation because of unique or unusual impacts associated with them. Uh, the property is located on the west side of Ogden Avenue, generally at the intersection of Trendle and Ogden Avenue. Uh, zoomed in here to show the outline of the site. Uh, the property has frontage on both Ogden Avenue and Trendle Road. Uh, with the zoning on the property, the entire property itself is zoned B3 General Services and Highway Business District. There's an adjacent uh, R1 and R4 residential zoning classifications, uh, B3 immediately to the east north and office research and manufacturing uh, to the north as well. The petitioner in Bell Tires proposed to construct a one-story, 900 square foot uh, building shown here in Brown in the northeast corner of the site. Uh, the building is set back 162 feet from the south property line. Access from access to the property will be provided via right in and right out on uh, Ogden Avenue. And an access point on Drendel will also provide it. Access on Drendel will allow inbound traffic from both southbound and northbound. We'll be able to turn into the site. Uh, outbound traffic is limited to right out northbound only. Uh, signage and a, and a median pork shop will be provided uh, to ensure this movement so there's no traffic uh, moving southbound on Drendel off the site. Uh, the village recently implemented uh, parking restrictions on both sides of Drendel Road, just north of this site. Uh, and uh, if the, since the planning commission was meeting in March, uh, that uh, proposal for uh, fully implementing those items in parking restrictions will be the next first reading item. We're here in Chapter 14 of the Municipal Code uh, for Motor Vehicles and Traffic. Uh, parking is provided adjacent to the building and then further south on the site. Uh, the paved area that you see south of the building allows all tire vehicles an opportunity to maneuver on site without having to maneuver on any of the adjacent roadways. With regard to stormwater, there's just a rate garden provided to accommodate stormwater regulations. Uh, the site is generally higher along that avenue, so the water will flow southbound and, and then enter into a swale between the parking lot and the south parking lot, and then the water will be piped into the rain garden. Uh, and so the stormwater will be reviewed at time of permit to ensure compliance, uh, but as of right now, it will meet the stormwater ordinance as well. Uh, the petitioners provide additional items to address uh, concerns that were raised uh, during the plan commission hearing, so I'd like to go over a few of those. Uh, the first one is a center median here on the Drendel Road access point, uh, which will further define movements out as uh, northbound right turns only. Enhanced landscaping has been provided along the south property line. Uh, the petitioner originally proposed a wood fence here, but they are now uh, modifying that to provide an eight-foot tall masonry wall to be constructed along the south and east property lines adjacent to the residential zoning classification properties. Uh, the wall will sit in an elevation of 729, uh, and then the building is proposed to be at 734.5. This is due, like I mentioned earlier, to the grading on the site. Uh, this is a cross-section of the parking lot. On the left-hand side, of the stormwater swell is shown moving to the right. Uh, landscaping, uh, the enhanced landscaping in those locations around the swell, uh, the masonry wall, the eight-foot tall masonry wall, and then uh, the residence over to the right that's immediately adjacent to the site. Additionally, this is an image provided by the petitioner uh, that shows a view from Drendel, at Drendel Road looking northbound. And you can see the adjacent uh, single-family house there with the eight-foot tall masonry wall. Uh, Bell Tire will next follow the recommendation from their sound study and place the pedestal grinder machine in a separate room uh, with the door and with the uh, sound barriers that were identified in option one. The room was labeled as a storage room in the original drawings and is located on the east side of the building. Light fixtures have been removed from this area to uh, better provide uh, less light pollution onto the residential properties. Uh, petitioners also provided a test drive route uh, showing the drive, test drives taking place in Ogden, Cross, Warrenville, and Authority Drive. Uh, those also allows test drives to be uh, provided on arterial streets as well. Uh, the petitioners also provide some enhancements to the appearance of the building by providing carriage style bay doors. Uh, this is on the west elevation where the bay doors are. And then you can see throughout uh, the entire facades there, they've provided a limestone uh, cast stone base as well uh, to provide some more visual uh, appearances to the building as well. With regard to the comprehensive plan, the north part of the site is identified as corridor commercial while the south part is identified as single-family residential. Uh, as you may recall, uh, the comprehensive plan is a visionary document 
uh, while the zoning ordinance is the regulatory document for the property and the property is entirely zone B3 uh, general services and highway business. The comp plan calls for increased lot depth along Ogden Avenue, developments that should provide screening and landscaping to buffer adjacent properties and enhance the sales tax uh, and create more local jobs uh, in the community. Uh, the special use again is subject to approval criteria in section 12.050.h uh, and reiterating special uses are those uses that are allowed in the zoning district as they're generally appropriate for the area but may require special regulation because of unique or unusual impacts associated with them. Uh, staff believes that the approval criteria have been met and recommends approval of the request as shown uh, with the conditions listed in the draft ordinance. I'd be happy to answer any questions the council may have. Uh, petitioner is here as well, our Chris Enright. I represent Bell Tires here, and he, be, he has a presentation uh, to present as well. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Stan. Uh, before we go away from Stan, any questions from the council for staff? I, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> the um, sound barriers that were in the packet are for the grinding room only, is that correct? Yes, that would be associated with the grinding room with option one. And then um, in the, the council questions, there was um, a question around the electric tools versus the pneumatic. And it appears that they are planning on using electric. Um, do we have any means to enforce that? I believe they're planning on using electric. If there's yep. specific questions about uh, electric versus pneumatic, I believe they'd be better off to uh, answer that question. Okay. Great. As far as the enforcement goes, I think we'd, we would rely on our general noise regulations uh, yeah. mm -hmm. any type of enforcement. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. I do have a uh, stormwater question. Mm -hmm. Please. Um, the uh, eight-foot wall along the south end of the property, um, all of, it's hey, all of the property south of there. Commissioner Davenport. Yep. You, sir, oh, hold up, sorry. Mike, closer, please. Thanks. That better? Um, all the property to the south, also the elevation comes back up. Um, so would the wall that's being proposed impede the flow of water from those properties to the south onto this property, right, onto the swale? I'd have, to I'd have to look at the plans in more detail to provide that answer. And, and then the other question I had was there's an existing stormwater pipe running from the southeast corner to the detention area at the northwest corner. And I didn't see anything in the, um, in the plans that really said any, how that was gonna be handled. I'd have to look closer at that as well. Okay. I think both of those will be addressed in the engineering submittal. Um, we'll make sure that the wall does not impede stormwater uh, running underneath it. If it's flowing there now, we'll have the petitioner design it in such a way that that will continue. And we can double check how they'll be treating the existing infrastructure, whether that will remain or whether that will be relocated or just uh, replaced. So Perfect. we'll probably pick that up at uh, engineering review. Yep. I assumed as much, but mm -hmm. thank you, Commissioner. Yep. Any other questions for staff? Stan, you said the petitioner has a uh, presentation? That's correct, Mayor Pro Tem. Okay. Sorry. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council, uh, Mr. Pavovich, members of the staff, uh, and our neighbors. Thanks for the opportunity for being able to speak tonight on behalf of this project. My name is Chris Enright. I'm the architect for Bell Tire. Uh, I've been working with uh, the Barnes family who owns Bell Tire for 25 years and developing some hundred stores across four states. I look forward to the opportunity for doing that here this evening here in Downers Grove. Um, with me tonight uh, to answer any questions should they arise is our Mandy Kuchar, our sound engineer, uh, Brandon Farrow, our uh, design engineer and engineer record on the uh, property. And then we have uh, Quentin Jeffries, uh, director of property management, and Ian Martin, director of um, equipment for Bell Tire, should there be any questions on anything specific tonight. <clears throat> uh, following Mr. Pavovich's presentation, um, uh, just wanted to, let's see what we're going with this. Go too far. 
<laughs> While we're dealing with the uh, technical issue, I'll just um, request that, like everybody else in the audience, we keep the comment to about five minutes. Okay. Uh, I was going to handle that once we got to the public portion of it, but I um, want to make sure we treat everybody equally. Yeah, we'll, thank you. I'll blaze through this as quickly as I can. I'll just touch on a few of these items. <clears throat> I should have known better. I'm not allowed to touch anything electronic in my office, so that's why I have Brandon here with me. So I didn't think it was actually needed, but apparently it is, so my apologies. <clears throat> okay, next slide. <clears throat> okay, uh, we've been working with the village for about a year on this. Um, these are just the, some of the, the 40 professionals that have been working on this, uh, on this project, um, engineers, uh, staff, uh, IDOT, et cetera. Next slide, please. Uh, as indicated, our location is uh, just east of the uh, 355 Interstate Freeway, uh, south of the Interstate 88 Freeway and on Ogden Avenue, um, uh, where we have about 1,000 feet to our west is the actual on-ramp to uh, Interstate 88. Go to the next one. This is uh, from the uh, IDOT uh, traffic counts, uh, indicating that uh, on our site, directly next to our site, Ogden Avenue, we have about 27,800 cars per day. And on uh, Interstate 88, we have uh, approximately uh, 160,000 cars. And then on uh, Interstate 355 at that location, we have approximately uh, 146,000 cars per day. Next slide please this is a traffic analysis from a traffic uh, report that we submitted in, uh, looking at the intersections of Drendel and Ogden and then Ogden and McDonald's this is a study that lasted over five years and with all the traffic that's in that area there have only been six crashes in that five-year period of time uh, three at each location next slide please uh, as indicated in Ms. Popovich's uh, presentation, we're put, uh, there'll be no parking on Drendel, so any uh, concerns regarding uh, the traffic, or the, I'm not sorry, traffic, but parking on Drendel by some of the other users uh, will be alleviated by the no parking signs on, uh, on Drendel. And Bell themselves will not park their vehicles on Drendel. Everything will be on site where the vehicles will not be allowed to park on Drendel. As indicated with the master plan, we are corridor commercial. Um, corridor commercial is um, specifically related to automotive uses, I'm sorry, auto related and to other uses uh, such as uh, retail, office, and uh, multifamily. So our use is specifically uh, akin to uh, the special use. Zoning follows along with this, where the zoning all the way along, all the way along Drendel, or I'm sorry, Ogden, the entire uh, width of uh, village of uh, Downers Grove is B3, highly intensive commercial zoning, uh, essentially where we have commercial frontage with uh, residential behind all the properties. As indicated, this is the test drive route. There are some concerns about uh, vehicles going into the neighborhood being uh, test driven. Uh, the fact of the matter is with Bell, we provided this, this test drive route. Uh, because uh, when they test the vehicles, they want to make sure that they can uh, replicate the problems that either the client has or that the uh, vehicle has been repaired properly. So we need to get um, proper traffic and um, more uh, highly voluminous type um, traffic routes. So this is more ideal traffic route for us. Uh, the district managers will indicate and verify what those routes are and mandate it for each store. These are, as a context, these are all the special uses uh, that we've determined all the way along uh, Ogden Avenue, where there are either automotive or drive-through type uses all the way along uh, the corridor of Ogden. And each one of those locations has uh, some type of residential uh, directly behind their existing use. There's approximately 40 of those uses currently uh, to date. Uh, actually, that investment is wrong. The store will it be in the, this Bell will be investing approximately five million dollars into the store. Uh, that's the total cost of the land with the development of the property. The estimated sales uh, for a year will be approximately that four million dollars, uh, of which uh, the uh, village will enjoy por portions of that tax base. This is the drainage map uh, that was alluded to before, that uh, greenish area, uh, and then vertically is the rain garden. That is the area which the, all of the water from our property uh, drains to, 
uh, and to uh, address the uh, commissioner's question regarding the drainage from uh, going underneath the fences we are actually collecting water from underneath uh, the fence the fence has been designed and we'll show you in a picture in a second uh, to actually transmit water underneath that fence from the neighbors in the perimeter and there's actually a swale that's designed to collect all that water uh, and take it into the rain garden and then eventually into that area up in the northwest corner which is an existing regional detention pond uh, the go back one, one other question to address is is that there is a current uh, drain line that runs uh, that collects water from the neighborhood and uh, runs diagonally as it was indicated underneath the property that easement is in place and that water drains directly uh, underneath our property into the regional detention pond that regional detention pond by the way was purchased by the county for the sole purpose of providing uh, drainage relief for the residents to the south and of course it accomplishes two things it then prevents any sort of further development from corner and it creates a buffer for the front of our property it's permanent uh, sound is indicated the sound report has been submitted uh, there have been a variety of elements that we've taken uh, into account to do the study. Uh, our sound engineer can address these comments specifically and how the report was, was created. Um, however, as indicated, our, uh, we will meet the sound ordinance uh, by virtue of incorporating the uh, interior implementations and as well as the distance of the building from the property line, the fact that there's no, do there's no service base facing the south or to the east. Uh, and the, of course, the sound wall that goes around the perimeter of the property. Landscape, we directed our landscape architect to <coughs> install the largest trees available and to pack the site as much as they could with landscaping, t uh, short of um, putting the plants at risk because they're too crammed in there. So that was a directive that we gave them. As you can see from the upper left-hand corner, that's the uh, uh, image of the fence or the sound wall. Uh, there's piers every eight feet or so, or every eight feet exactly, and then there's a four or six inch uh, gap at the bottom to allow rainwater to, uh, to go through the bottom of the, of the, uh, the uh, sound wall. Hours of operation, um, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday, eight to six, and then Monday and Thursday, eight to eight, and then uh, Saturday, eight to five, and they're closed <coughs> Sunday. Every one of Bell's stores has the exact same hours of operation in all 165 of their stores now. Um, on average, the store is open uh, nine hours per day per week when you average it all out. As a comparison, McDonald's is open 19 hours a day, opening at five and closing at 11. Architecture is indicated before touching on it that we're adding uh, the overhead doors and then um, uh, the opaque the opaque doors and I already sort of concluded no that's no, no sense going through it so we're happy to answer any questions thank you very much any questions for the petitioner Commissioner Sask if you could. I have a couple um, just for clarity's sake um, who is responsible for the maintenance of the bioswale in the rain garden that'll be the uh, well essentially property management Beltari has a property management system and they're right. responsible for everything Excellent. Um, and then I guess my only other question is, how, how much use do you expect that Drindle Road access to, to have in or out, given that you're, you don't plan on using that at all for any of the test drives and whatnot? Kind of how, right. how do you see that, that access used? Well, being that we have approval from IDOT for the curb cut currently that we're proposing, which is a right in, right out on to Ogden, that is going to be our main, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, uh, tra point of traffic for um, our customers. Um, the Drendel Road access is going to be uh, pretty much what we're planning on it to be is for uh, any kind of delivery that we may have that were for a vehicle that can't get into uh, into off of Ogden Avenue. Um, so obviously we can't turn left um, and so if anyone wants to turn right they would usually typically going back onto Ogden they would go back out onto Ogden um, or they might go turn right onto Drendel to turn left uh, onto Ogden. That would be the, really the main, re the main reason for them to exiting that, that, that road. Thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner okay. Gilmartin. <clears throat> Maybe for the sound engineer, um, a question regarding the gap in the brick wall. Uh, does that reduce its abil ability to attenuate the sound? Uh, hi, my name's Mandy Kacher, Soundscape Engineering. Um, 
Yes, it does, but in this particular case, that's not a concern because if you look at the report, mm -hmm. the 65 DBA yeah. marker is, is well removed from that wall. Mm -hmm. so, so it will allow some sound to get through okay. at the, the lower um, portion, but it, it's not um, going to affect the noise ordinance or the prediction. And have you done sound analysis for other bell tires? Yes, we have. So I think in your report, you talked a bit about the frequencies and what frequencies are maybe more difficult to control. Maybe the lower frequencies are tend to pass through. Is that correct? Pass through. They would not pass through masonry, if that's what you're referring to. No, just to. in general, the lower frequencies tend to be harder to uh, attenuate. That's true. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you have any sort of comparison or analysis of other bell tires and where sort of the frequency range that comes out of, you know, a bell tire in all the mm. different equipment and how that might compare or contrast against what we might be. Uh, yeah, the, the best example of that mm -hmm. would be um, if, do you have the report in front of you? Uh, I can pull it up in front of me, but happy okay. to have yeah, you so summarize on, on page, it for me. Yes, yeah. so on page three, uh, okay. there's the figure that compares the pneumatic wrenches with the mm -hmm. battery wrench. Yeah. And, and so you can see that the this is an unweighted, or no, let me take that back. It's A-weighted. Weighted, so yeah. it's more like what we hear. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see that the peak of the, the highest levels in per octave band um, are concentrated in the, um, I'd say, from 500 hertz to about 8,000, 4,000, 8,000. Okay. So, so that's not considered an architectural acoustics low frequency. Got it. So most of it is high frequency. Okay. It is. It's higher yeah. frequency, okay. which are it's easier to control uh, as far as if you're talking about walls that block sound. Got it. And then the last question on the on the grinding room, um, can you talk a little bit about the treatment that would be? It was I think it was recommended, and I don't know if this is for you or um, Chris, the architect, but in terms of what attenuation would be there for the sound there being in its own private room but is there also some sound panels or things like that that were going to be implemented that's correct yeah so so the sound blocking portion is the room itself is so that, if you have yeah. a gypsum board wall or if it's block i'm not exactly mm -hmm. sure um they that will take the sound level down uh depending on again what the materials is probably about 35 to 50 decibels okay. depending on what it is now that the door itself is probably only going to block about 30 decibels okay. but that's still substantial mm -hmm. 30 decibels is about one sixth of the sound level that would be produced and then um the absorption the absorbing panels mm -hmm. which were recommended on the two uh, adjacent walls for the interior what that does is that reduces the sound energy within the space Got it. and so that there's less energy to escape from the room um, but the, the main sound uh, the, the main way to attenuate the sound is through the enclosure itself so you have the enclosure and then the space and then the interior walls of the main garage for lack of a better word that will also have attenuation on it? Um, the, the only sound absorption that's needed, yep. um, and, and it's really technically not needed, it's just good practice, is within mm -hmm. that grinder room. Within so wherever room that's housed, mm -hmm. and, and, and in part it's just for comfort of the person. So Because when you have a loud piece of equipment and it was in a large space and now you're putting it in a small space, mm -hmm. the sound energy will be concentrated. So the absorption on the walls and the absorptive ceiling, the um, acoustic tile ceiling, will all work to reduce some of that energy. And could you, last question, could you give us any point of reference for those not familiar what 35 dB might be? Is there what a, a noise that might be, that you might reference for, for those to understand? Well, th th yeah, 35 was the reduction yeah. in uh, sound. So maybe then what's so, so, yeah. so yes, a 20 decibel reduction, well, it, it's a log scale, so it's kind of, it, if you have a 3 dB reduction, it's a just noticeable difference. If you have a 10 dB reduction, it's twice as quiet, mm -hmm. or, or half as loud. And then if you have a 20 decibel reduction, it's a quarter as loud. Mm -hmm. So a 35 decibel reduction is you're talking about probably about six or seven uh, times as quiet okay. as it would have been without the enclosure. So it, it's, it's blocking quite a bit of sound. Okay. It's, um, 
another way to look at it would be like typical for an office door. Mm -hmm. If you have a door, um, well, <laughs> most office doors aren't sealed. Mm -hmm. um, but if you had a nice sealed office door, it would be somebody's talking at a normal volume in there and you're outside the door and you can hear that somebody's mm -hmm. talking in there, but you can't really tell what they're saying and it's kind of mumbled and quiet. That that would be a, an approximate uh, Comparison. estimate of what a 35 decibel reduction would be. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from the council? Okay. Then I will uh, open it up for public comment. We ask you to keep your comments to five minutes or less. Um, We'd love to hear from you. Good evening. I hope I don't upset everything. No. No, you'll be just fine. My name's Elizabeth Rigsby. I'm an 80 year resident of Downers Grove, and I was not born here. I am more interested, first of all, that Ogden Avenue will look a little better. I would like to come in from the west and see a big sign saying, welcome to Downers Grove with flowers and everything else. We have none of that. We have crap up there. All the way from the tollway down, it's a disaster. We should not be proud of it. I'm not. And you're fighting about putting up a nice looking building and tearing down a two and a half story rotten wood place with some sheds. Does that make sense in today's society? Not to me, and I know I'm voicing opinions because I'm an old lady. But I lived in Downers Grove, I taught in Downers Grove, and I love Downers Grove. And I have since the day I moved here when I was 11 years old. There was not a paved street past 55th when I moved here. The local district went from Burlington to Maple, and Ogden Avenue has always been the business district. Whether there, was, there were homes there and they tore them down, people had to get out, and they built buildings to have commerce. Now we have a situation where we have, what, 140,000 people in Downers Grove? You are their representatives. Not only the 20 or 30 people that live up there in back of that tire store. We all want to see Downers Grove progress. We always want it to be nice, and we want to be proud of it. <coughs> and I'm not proud of a lot of things I've seen. I understand we allowed someone who makes vape or dope or something at Belmont and Finley. If I had a choice to vote on that, it would have been no. But I wouldn't do it, I wouldn't stop the progress. Because you make the laws to make them obey having their business there. Not keeping the businesses from coming. And I, and I don't know what else to say except Keep Downers Grove a nice town. Don't let a few people push what 140 people may not even care about, or if they do, there'll be some that would like the idea and some that wouldn't, and that's what America's about. Thank you, ma'am. If we, folks, folks, I'd like to, keep a, a good level of decorum. Whether you like what someone has to say or don't, let's try to keep our reactions to ourselves. Um, you know, we don't want it to become a, a clapping or booing contest. Um, secondly, just, just one thing. Um, while I love the idea that one day Downers Grove might end up at 150,000 residents, um, we're not quite that big currently. We're closer to 50,000. Our daytime population is probably somewhere around twice that. Um, but uh, we are a good sized town. Please. Hi, um, my name is Meredith Rogers, and I'm the, um, I live at 4504 Drendel Road in Downers Grove. Um, I just wanted to show you, I know I've attached um, 
all these pictures um, to um, my email that I sent out. Yeah. If you could just give them to Mr. Baker. Oh. Uh, we'll get them all the way around, everybody. Right. Thank you. Those are some pictures that I took. Um, I did want to ask when I was reading the um, the report, it says the the two for the mitigation for the pedestal grinder room, option one was the pedestal grinder room and it said this will reduce the pedestal grinder sound by 25 dBA and then option two was seven to 10 dBA and she said 35. So I just want to make sure, is it 35 or 25? So maybe mm -hmm. answer that, not right this second, but um, um, also, um, I did send an email. I just wanted to um, also talk about two real quick the um, uh, the where the proposed um, finished floor elevation for the main building. Um, my neighbor, um, Mr. Gupta, he's at 4505 Journal Road. He's the, he can't be here tonight, um, but I believe he's live streaming. Streaming. He's um, the one that's right next to. Um, where the wall is going to be um, and he said he had done some measurement and he said the main building is at thir uh, 734 um, point five feet whereas the property line uh, where they plan to build the eight foot masonry wall originally was the fence um, and to his house is at 727 and he said that would be a 7.5 drop so at the eight foot fen fence sorry masonry wall uh, would basically be a six inch foot step so like when you as they showed in the thing is Here's um, where it's um, the buildings here, and then it comes down, and then his property goes up. And they're proposing to put like here's his property. They're proposing to put the wall here, but if you put just eight feet, you can see right over it. So I'm proposing me a 12 foot wall. Um, my, in my proposal in my email also is just a um, a question whether they can move the wall where the parking lot is it's the parking lot and then the wall and then all the green plantings after that so we so you see all the greenery um and then you, you see the wall first at the parking lot and then all the greenery and then um 4505 drendel road does that make sense <coughs> it's it's in my email um i guess my other question was um that um, no one has really addressed the residents that face west that's me and my neighbor and a couple other neighbors and the bay doors are facing west and during the summer months they're going to be nice and wide open um, i don't think there should be any music coming from beltire i don't want to hear the music and that um, there are other people who are living on drendel road not just 45 4505 which is the neighbor that's adjacent to the property so we're here and we are um, also would be hearing all those the noise as well um it is stated in my email regarding all the noise um you know it would be in loud short short bursts i know there are some um talking about um that if there are certain minutes of the, that there are times that that's acceptable but i don't think it would should be acceptable when i have my windows wide open and i'm sitting on my front porch that i have to hear loud short bursts every 20 minutes that that that's acceptable i don't think that's acceptable for the um for for me or any of the other residents that are on the west side that the west bays are facing my residence um i did also want to um, say um, that these are predictions by sound systems um, i know that, that that's what they're stating um, my other question was um, if uh, there's an existing, and I did put a picture in my email, there's an existing um, road or like outlet from the property now that's kind of a little further north. Um, and that's kind of where the rain garden was going to be located. So they were gonna move the entrance down further south next to 4505 Drendel Road. And my question was, or in my proposal was, you know, could the, in and out stay there and then the rain garden and then um and then the the plantings and the wall so that way the entrance and exit um it stays a little further north and not so intrusive in into the neighborhood um sorry i've got lots of um lots of questions um um i apologize um other so this is mostly in my email um the other quite you know from just a personal standpoint you know i know um it would bring you know a lot of revenue and tax dollars you know to the village i understand i understand that but um you know sometimes you have to consider you know residents and what how this affects residents i totally am um supportive of business 
I, I um, you know, want there to be business, but sometimes things are just not the right fit for certain areas of our, of our um, village. Um, um, uh, my other question was um, uh, that you can see in my email, um, I've sent several pictures regarding the parking. Um, we, um, after the signs were put up, um, uh, the village did have to be called because people parked there anyway, because they just, you know, didn't care and did it and parked there anyway. Not that that's going to happen, but, you know, we just wanted to, um, I just wanted to highlight that. Also, the curb, I can't remember what it's called, but I don't know how tall the, the curb cut or whatever is going to be. Um, I've seen, and I'm sure everybody's seen a million times, that, you know, you have it and it's, maybe this high and people are like, I'm not waiting and they turn anyway. So I know it's there for deterrent and the signs are there for deterrent, but I just have to point that out that it does happen. Um, I was coming out of Speedway uh, in, um, on the north end of town getting gas and there is a sign that says, no, you can't turn right. And I followed that and the person in front of me just turned right anyway, because they you know, didn't care. But that, that's just on my, my noting. Um, my other question is they talked about um, reducing the lighting um, in the building, um, but it doesn't state what the lighting is or what the candle um, lighting is for the lights. So I guess that's another question that I have. What is it? Is it, is it, within, is it within the ordinance? I think it's 10.10 .10 candles um, for the lighting for the whole entire building. Um, our other um, just request was um, in the Naperville store, um, and it's kind of like here's Ogden Avenue and then you can turn in in the Naperville store and then right there is a, an illuminated bell tire sign. Um, we request that there's no illuminated bell tire sign uh, on Drendel Road to be there um, like it is on in Naperville. So I, I think that's just a reasonable request not to have that um, be there as well. Um, my other last request um, this is about your fourth last request and you're at about seven and a half I know I'm minutes. so sorry okay I'm really quick sorry well I'm just nervous and so I, um, uh, the last is um, just proposing um, just taller trees in the plantings if that's possible um, we live in Illinois uh, you know six foot trees are going to take a long time to 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 grow um, so instead of the six foot trees the ten foot trees this, uh, instead of the six foot high ornamental trees, 10 foot, instead of the four foot caliber shade trees, eight foot caliber tree, uh, caliber shade trees. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm Scott Rogers, also at 4504, so I'll try not to uh, repeat anything or get myself in trouble uh, at home or here. Um, so I, I sent everyone an email before this meeting, but I just want to recap a couple of things and try not to repeat items that have already um, been brought up. Uh, but again, we live on the west side of Drendel and um, you know, repeatedly in the proposal it mentions that they've taken steps to uh, quote unquote face away from the residential neighbors to the west. Well, we are to the west and we are going to be impacted by this, so I think that that should be taken into consideration. Um, I also am supportive of business in Donners Grove. I welcome them to put something on Ogden Avenue. Um, what's there is not great. I just have some concerns about this particular development. Um, and in particular, they are around really three areas. One is access. So we've talked about Drendel Road. It's a residential street. Um, it sounds like, and it was noted tonight, the main reason for that access is for delivery trucks. So um, I would love if they could limit that access to only delivery trucks. Um, because there's already problems getting out from Drendel to Ogden Avenue in the morning um, <coughs> and evening rush and additional customer traffic is going to exacerbate that so that would be great um, I also think if you're going to allow both access in and out um, you could do a curb cut sort of like they do at the Belmont train station that allows cars to come in and out only from the north so that no one there's no need for anyone from the south on Drendel to get into Beltire if they want to do so they can turn right on Ogden going right there um, secondly is noise um, so I appreciate the noise study um, it did seem to me there's a lot of yellow on that map that got kept pretty close to our property um, I would want to know if that study was done with the bay doors open or closed um, as my wife mentioned um, we all know uh, doors open in the summertime the radio is going to be going it's gonna be loud if uh, they can't keep it under those levels with the doors open, I would suggest that they have to keep the doors closed, 
except when bringing vehicles in and out. Um, and then lastly, I would say on a visual, some of these were already mentioned, but you know, Illinois trees with the leaves don't exist for five, six months of the year, so it doesn't really help us to have big trees that have no leaves on them. Um, so anything we could do to have a more permanent barrier so that we don't see um, the, the property from our residents, that would be great, It'll help with the noise as well. Um, and there's really no mention of odor. Um, I don't know what the studies are from other um, establishments, but tires typically don't smell particularly great. Um, so I would like that to be at least considered as well. So that's all I got. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Any other public comment? <clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. My name is Donna Samiak. I live at 4615 Drindle Road. We are a block and a half south of where Bell Tire proposes to go in. I have just some concerns, questions. They say they're going to use electric tools. Can we get a guarantee that they will strictly use electric tools? And that at some time in the future, once they are an established business, switch the, to the pneumatic, more noisy tools. My husband was a mechanic for 40 years. I know the difference between the sound of a pneumatic tool and electric tool, and it's quite a major difference in sound. Um, and, you know, do we have any kind of a recourse if they do switch to the pneumatic tools? You know what what would be the the process then um another concern if this pro proceeds and they start building construction traffic will that be limited to coming in off of ogden avenue to the construction site or will they be allowed to come in off of drendel road to the construction site that's a major concern because construction Trucks take a long time to unload, and if they've got one truck already there unloading, what's to keep the second truck from stopping on Drindle, unloading, and then going up the little access road? So I would like to see construction traffic only from, Drin uh, from Ogden Avenue. Kind of talked about the flooding issues, but along with that, my concern is for the animals and the birds in the neighborhood that use that retention pond as a water source. We have a lot of rabbits, squirrels, raccoons, possums, deer, wild feral cats, and we have dogs that run, sometimes get loose and run in the neighborhood. And anytime you're working on a car, you're going to have grease and oil, pollution, getting on the ground and possibly running in, getting into the grass, into the groundwater, which is going to go into the retention pond and possibly affect the health and well-being of the animals. And my last point would be our quality of life on the street is going to be severely impacted by this. From the time they start construction until the end of time. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jeff Mann. I'm, I'm on Cross Street. And I just want to say I love Bell Tire. I'm a big fan. I'm originally from Detroit, so I know who Bud Bell Tire is, and I am a customer. But we have a traffic problem on Cross Street, and it's been that way for years. And granted, I saw the map of the uh, drive, but face, we, let's face facts. It's safer to make right turns and go back. And the traffic has been increasing and from the train station and we've also had traffic from Ziegler's uh, uh, auto dealership. When we first agreed to have Ziegler 
build their uh, dealership on the corner of Ogden and, and uh, Cross, they promised not to do drives up and down the street. Well, they're doing it. Now, it's not to say that your employees would do it. They probably would follow your rules, but rules are made to be broken. Last night or two nights ago, I was walking my dog. I had at least 15 cars come through on, Og on uh, Cross Street around 7, 7 p.m. Now, to get back to Bell Tire, if they do the rights, they would go on Ogden, maybe to Finley, come down to Burlington. And if the person doesn't know, they'll come up cross and they go, whoa, I can't make a, I can't get back to uh, Bell because I gotta make a left. Well, they'll have to go through Indianapolis, up Drendel, and then uh, back, on, back that way. Because they won't realize they could go all the way to Walnut, go up Walnut, and over and, avo and avoid the uh, neighborhood. It's the traffic's been really bad, and we've complained about it for years, and nothing has been done. Oh, they put stop signs, big deal. And, but <sighs> something's gotta be done because there's only a few ways to get from, like, from the train station or from uh, Burlington to get back up to Ogden, and one of them is Cross Street. And the traffic is just not acceptable for the children that are playing there, for even the people that are living, living uh, in the area. Also, being a truck driver, uh, sometimes you get lost. <laughs> Um, you may have to, you may pass Bell and you turn down the first street, which is cross, come down and try to get the trucks back. Well, you know, things can happen. So basically, I'm just worried more about the traffic than anything else. Um, I understand every, uh, the building and everything else, but it's basically the traffic that we're worried about. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Hey, fellas. I live at 4507 Drendel. I'm like pretty close to it. Um, the concerns that everybody's been talking about, stormwater, traffic, noise, they, they do exist already. And I think Bell Tire's trying to convince you more um, that they're going to take care of those things, but they don't really have that much proof that they're going to. I mean, as far as uh, the stormwater drain, the existing one, it floods all the time. And they're going to pave and cause more problems, and that's just going to double the problem worse. Traffic never enforced. And like the gentleman said, we all have to get out uh, to Ogden in the morning. Otherwise, we're forced to go all the way around, down up the back way across to Belmont. Doesn't make sense. Um, and then for them to impose a problem with our uh, intersection or street because IDOT turned them down. They should have had it out with IDOT and said, hey, we're, we're Bell Tire. We want to get out, just like McDonald's or anyone else. But they couldn't do it. Um, I agree with the ladies for revenue for Downers Grove, but there's plenty of empty establishments all the way from 355 to Westmont that they could have looked at, wouldn't have affected any residential at all. They're a little too much north into our um, block, um, which I think that's what really concerns everyone. If they were a little further up towards Ogden, they turned their building towards Ogden, it would make a lot more sense. And like somebody said, all the other special use, those garage doors are facing Ogden and they're not right up on top of residence. So you could see that if you rode down Ogden. Um, I don't want to take up a lot of time, but mostly I'm going to point out they're trying to pigeonhole themselves into something that they should have chose more wisely. And I'm hoping you guys 
understand it's for us Downers Grove's residents to better value our neighborhood and not sell out, you know, to big money. Thanks, guys. Sir, could we get your name for the record, please? Oh, Gary Horak, 4507 Trendle Road. Thank you. Hi, my name is Martha Richardson, and I live on 4416 Cross Street. And I have uh, certain uh, concerns, major concerns, and that is well water. We have a lot of residents on Cross Street that are still on well water. And the EPA is still uh, surveying and, you know, with this lock former, this happened like before I moved in, but lock former and um, the Ellis Park and um, that contaminated homes and all that. And um, that is a big concern. Have you guys checked into that, into the well water and how uh, bell tire, uh, any fluids or anything that are gonna go into the ground? And also I have um, the, our property taxes, like they like to sell our homes no one's gonna want to live next to bell tire and you know I'm for business because you know I like all the downtown businesses every day is a Sunday and all of that um, but I don't think that bell tire is a good fit for that because it sits into residential it's not just Ogden it goes all the way into the residential um, so does anybody know like how much our properties would be worth once they move in? Anybody? So that's another concern of me and my neighbors and um, also health risks. Would you want to move your family into a bell tire? Think about it. Anyone? Would you like to live? Mr. Tooley, would you like to live in uh, next to a bell tire? Ma'am, ma'am, this isn't really a, a question and answer with the council. We're, well, we're going to listen are, to all of your comments. These, well, we're going to answer whatever questions my, we can through staff. I know, but these are my concerns and my neighbors. And then the next thing is the easement. DuPage County, 2539 Ogden, as you guys know, sits all the way into residential. Back in 2005, when uh, Mr. Kubis was building his uh, house, he raised up the uh, whole back of his property and flooded all of the homes to the east of him. And DuPage County had to come and put the easement so our homes, our backyards would not flood. And it goes right through uh, 2539 Ogden and the water goes into that retention pond that the EPA also worked on and who's going to be taking care of that I would like to know because our homes my home the next door like four five homes down we still get soggy yards in the back so our quality of life with all the noise and traffic with bell tire is not going to be good for our neighborhood so just think about it would you want your family to move in there in any of our homes thank you thank you Hi, my name is Todd Richardson. I also live at 4416 Cross Street. And my backyard, the western portion, is going to come right up against Bell Tire. Um, so I would just want to say I agree with the concerns that have already been mentioned. Um, I also support business in Downers Grove. I personally believe that another type of business that's less intrusive to the neighbors would be better for that location. Uh, my main concerns are light pollution, noise pollution, uh, air quality, um, and uh, fluid uh, 
different types of fluid runoff um, that will potentially um, increase pollution, ground pollution in the area. Um, so I just I don't want to reiterate things that have already um, been said, and, but I support things that have been said. Um, my and another main concern of mine, um, one that really bothers me and I'd like to see addressed, is the test drive route. Um, uh, as was mentioned before, uh, we've had issues um, in that whole block and uh, particularly down Cross Street. Um, this will significantly add to the traffic uh, in our area and um, it's already bad enough and it will definitely get worse. Um, it's, it's not only a nuisance, it is a true safety hazard for residents. Um, so that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public on this item? Okay. I'll bring it back to the council. Any other comments or questions from members of the council? Mr. Tully. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank everybody for the emails and the uh, time you took to come down here and share with us your views. Uh, obviously, what the neighborhood thinks and all residents in the community are very important. Uh, and just to answer the question, because decorum did not allow me to do so, I actually live closer to a fire station and a tornado siren than, than uh, the neighborhood does to Bell Tire. Uh, so we all make various choices in, in where, we, where we live. Uh, the, the issue here for me is that um, we have a set of standards for granting special uses in Downers Grove, and it was mentioned by staff, it's Chapter 2812-050-H, that lays out what the standards are for special use. And I'm always going to be governed by that because those are the rules that we put out there, not only for our residents, but for the village council, but also for any business that might be looking to come to Downers Grove. And contrary to popular belief, we often don't get to pick and choose. We have a comprehensive plan. We have uh, regulations and we have land uses and people will come and look at our plans and say, ah, that might fit my business. I'd like to go there. And then they make a request. And here, um, the request is one that is for a use that is actually permitted in this district. So they're not asking for any special permission. And as I understand it, there are no exceptions or variances or other things that are being requested by the business. So they're not asking for any favors here. What they're simply doing is saying there's a parcel that your comprehensive plan, and before that, the Ogden Avenue Master Plan, basically encouraged, um, among other things, lot consolidation, which is that's part of what's going to be done here should this be approved. So the three standards are pretty simple. The first one is, is whether the proposed use is expressly authorized as a special use in the district in which it is to be located. And the answer is, well, yes, it is. And in fact, uh, we have multiple other very similar uses already up and down Ogden Avenue. So one of the questions I had is whether, and it's been a while, I'm out of practice, um, have we had other odor and noise complaints from other residents? So for example, on Lee, behind the Merlin, I could go on and on and on. Um, have we seen or experienced it? Because it's one thing to not know what's going to happen, uh, but it would be interesting to know what have the experiences been of other people who live very close to other automotive facilities. I don't recall any four years ago, but things could have changed. Um, so, so here, not only is the use expressly authorized, but and there are many others already on Ogden, Ogden Avenue, so it's very hard to say we don't want this one because there's already a bunch of other ones here. Uh, but as mentioned, there's a lot of consolidation going on here, which is something that the village has promoted and actively uh, solicited. Uh, and again, not, there's no request here for any exceptions or variances with respect to setbacks or height or width or anything like that. Um, the second standard is, does the proposed use of the proposed location, is it necessary or desirable to provide a service or facility that is in the interest of the public convenience and will contribute to the general welfare of the neighborhood or the community? Okay, well, you can get reasonable people to disagree about that. Uh, but the young woman said earlier that we have to think in, in terms of the best interest of the entire community, not just necessarily that neighborhood, because that's what we're elected to do. Um, and it's certainly a use that clearly there is a need for or there's a uh, support for because we have them already in town. Um, and as mentioned, quite frankly, going all the way back 20 years ago, one of the objectives of the Ogden Avenue Master Plan before it became part of the comprehensive plan was to encourage lot consolidation in uh, along Ogden Avenue because Ogden Avenue used to be called Old Plank Road for a reason. And there was a lot of shallow lots and it's very challenging when it comes to development. So we had to do things to encourage 
uh, a more modern use of Ogden Avenue and maybe get those gateway signs someday. So the third point then is, that is uh, for the criteria for special use is does the proposed, uh, I'm sorry, that the proposed use will not in the particular case be detrimental to the health, safety, or general welfare of persons residing or working in the vicinity or be injurious to property values or improvements in the vicinity? Fair question. So a lot of you are raising uh, very legitimate questions about how is this going to affect us from, from noise, from parking and traffic, um, light pollution, stormwater issues, uh, sign ordinance came up, fluid runoff, as well as what happens if there are any violations of the special use. All fair questions. Um, the other thing I want to point out is in addition to these three factors that there's another section of the code 2812050G3 which says the village council can impose conditions or restrictions mm -hmm. upon a special use request in order to ameliorate or lessen uh, any perceived uh, issues that might be impactful in the neighborhood. So we're very sensitive to that and I think that there have been a lot of conversation and attempts to try to address a number of these issues and I just want to walk through a few of them in my mind. Um, Noise is obviously a big one, um, but I've seen efforts to try to mitigate the noise, and I would absolutely want to see that the grinder take place in a separate room. I think that's pretty much a no-brainer, and I'm glad to see the petitioner is proposing that. And then we have our general noise ordinance, which is again why I asked the question about are there other automotive uses up and down Ogden Avenue where there's been a noise, uh, an odor, or other uh, issues, because I'm pretty much guessing they're using similar type of equipment. And I don't think we can enforce the types of tools they use. I think what we can enforce is our noise ordinance, our nuisance ordinances. So if there is a switch and it violates the ordinance, then we can enforce the ordinance. Um, parking and traffic is a legitimate question. And I drove there this, to, uh, this morning and, and found out that I really couldn't go anywhere because if you don't know the neighborhood, you're not gonna go in there. Um, I certainly didn't. Um, so, it, it, but, but it is a valid concern about uh, test driving. I know on Lee Avenue in years past, there was concerns about cars going up and down there and, and steps had to be taken. So certainly uh, a very stern message that uh, test driving up and down Drendel was not going to be tolerated and that will be enforced and also then putting in physical barriers that would, uh, not, you can't make it impossible, but physical barriers that would reduce the likelihood that someone was going to be, go up and down Drendel um, or uh, the other streets in that neighborhood. There's certainly a, a good measure to minimize any impact. Uh, stormwater is always a concern for everybody. Every time there's construction, there's stormwater concerns. Um, and that is really something that takes place at the next step. And we have a stormwater ordinance and we have stormwater engineers. And this petitioner, just like anybody else, will be required to meet the stormwater ordinance. And if that means adjustments have to be made to the plan in order for that to be effective, then it, that'll happen. Uh, that's, that's another layer of, of enforcement and protection here. Um, I believe the sign ordinance is being complied with, uh, with the monument sign that's in the front. So I don't think there's going to be anything unusual about the signage here. And uh, fluid runoff, I think, would be a concern, frankly, with any business. If that was being done in violation of local, state, or federal law, then I, they probably have a bigger problem to deal with. Um, the last thing I want to point out is that our ordinance also allows us that if someone is granted a special use with conditions, and I'm getting the sense there's going to be a number of conditions on this one and restrictions, if it gets passed, that if those um, conditions are violated, that that is potential grounds for revoking the special use. And that's something I've always said whenever a special use has been granted, is those conditions aren't suggestions. Those are mandatory. And if they're not followed and they're not complied with, then the risk to the petitioner is that they lose their special use. So I am still very interested in hearing other ways that the impact of the neighborhood can be mitigated. Uh, but I wanted to just frame this in my head that this is a business that looked at our plans and our rules and said, well, we seem to fit here. They're not asking for any favors or any exceptions. Um, we are very sensitive to the impact upon the neighborhood, and that's why we're talking about these other conditions, because they're, they're not required per se, but they are within the power of the village council to implement in order to uh, mitigate the concerns of the residents of the neighborhood. So would love to continue to hear from the rest of the council in terms of uh, what other things within reason can be done because we also want to be mindful of the fact that there are other businesses up and down Ogden Avenue that may not have been required to do some of these things and so there's a so there's an equity that's involved here too not that we can't always do better but so thank you Mayor Pro Tem. thank you any other comments or questions Commissioner I, I think uh, Commissioner Tully said it well um, and did a nice job summarizing the process I just it occurs to me that but for 
this special use provision, we wouldn't even have the ability to say, hey, that, that six foot fence ought to be an eight foot tall masonry wall and, and to look at the lighting and to look at the, um, uh, you know, some of the aesthetics and such. Uh, this, this process um, was put in place just so that we would have that opportunity to, to help mold and shape what happens here, right? Um, but this is something that's allowed um, by right um, is with a special use in, in the B3 district. And given that there's so much automotive up and down Ogden Avenue, this seems like an ideal location. Um, and in fact, the, uh, I think the aesthetics are quite nice. Um, and I see the opportunity here to improve um, some of the flooding issues that have happened um, in, the, in the neighborhood as well um, through this process. So um, I'll yield to other comments. Thank you. Commissioner Stesk, if you could. Yeah, I'm, I am in agreement with my, my fellow commissioners. Um, you know, there are, when, when you have business, businesses that are essentially taking over what is currently a basically vacant lot, you know, this is a, a large change. And so I don't deny that this is going to be temporarily disruptive, and I, I can empathize with that. But as my fellow commissioner said, you know, that they're, they're taking steps to go kind of above and beyond what our requirements are. And as Commissioner Tully stated, you know, those are mandated and those are requirements and we will enforce those. Um, I also just want to be clear um, that uh, that test drive route goes north, correct? So at no point will they be going south of Ogden Avenue. So nobody should be going down Walnut, Cross, Drendel, to down to Burlington, any of those routes, correct? That it's correct, and that's an area of focused enforcement uh, that uh, when it'll be in the condition of the ordinance if approved, and staff will monitor that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I will certainly be be kind of driving that property and and taking a look at it. But um, it's it's also an important reminder that they'll be following the same lighting, noise, other ordinances that we have in our neighborhoods. So for example, I have a lot that is kind of down the street from me and faces my upper level that has a very bright security light that goes on in the middle of the night. And it actually shines directly into my next door neighbor's bedroom. Um, it's not ideal, uh, but if it meets our lighting requirements, it's technically allowed. Um, and so it, in some cases, it isn't always even just businesses that are that have, have some, some bright lights. It can even happen in residential neighborhoods. So um, just a reminder that they are going to have to meet the same requirements that we expect of any of our residents and any of our neighbors. And that's going to, again, be a condition of that special use. Um, and we will be watching that closely. I know, you know, I, I have always have concerns with stormwater. For anybody that's familiar with Downers Grove, I live in Deer Creek, and so I know Commissioner Tully's like, oh yeah, you do get stormwater, because we were ascent we should have never been built. We were, we were built on a swamp. Um, and so I'm very sensitive to those concerns, and I'll be interested to hear more about what those stormwater plans are. Um, but I do appreciate the use of bioswales and the rain gardens, and using the infrastructure that is already there, and, and understanding kind of the patterns of flow. Um, because that really is going to yield the best results. So that's kind of where I stand now. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Commissioner Gilmar. Yes, thank you. A um, lot of comments uh, made from my fellow commissioners that I agree with. I won't, I won't repeat. I think um, we do have a, an opportunity here. The consolidation of the lots is what gives us that opportunity. Um, I think there are many like places on Ogden, and there, this location also has some differences that I think it's on us as a council to review, to try to mitigate that, as Commissioner Tully mentioned, as, as best as we can. Um, I think we've got some ideas already in terms of making sure that the sound attenuation um, stormwater issues are addressed. Um, I would love to, to hear more. Um, I personally uh, live four doors from the Firestone uh, on Ogden, so I have empathy. Um, but I, it's also a little different configuration. The Firestone faces Ogden, um, so I can see differences. I don't have a brick wall between me and that uh, facility, so um, I, I will say that the uh, additional considerations and changes that the petitioner added uh, seem to be an effort to be in, in good faith and make uh, changes to help uh, alleviate some of these challenges. Um, Again, I think it's on us as a, a council to make sure um, that we look 
and do as much as we can, um, as well as provide <clears throat> a good balance between making sure our businesses understand that we support and, and welcome them, but our residents also know um, that we are addressing their concerns as well. Um, given that, I think on the face of it, as it stands today, I, I think I would support this, I think with the conditions as we, we've discussed. Thank you. Thank you. I don't want to repeat uh, too much of what's been said. Um, with regard to stormwater, um, the, the stormwater ordinance has evolved quite a bit since 2005. Um, it's been uh, made much more stringent uh, over the years several times. Um, and this developer, uh, should the project go forward, will be required to comply with it down to the letter. Um, any concerns about runoff, I would hope, would be uh, first addressed by, you know, whether it's federal or state EPA regulations. Um, but obviously, if we're made aware of anything, we'll take whatever action we can. I think Commissioner Tully was right with regard to noise enforcement. Um, we don't necessarily have the ability to say, you know, thou shalt use this type of tool. Um, but we can stand and take a measurement where the code requires and say that's too loud or that's not. And uh, if we receive complaints, that's exactly what we'll do. Mm -hmm. And with regard to test drives, uh, we've run into this, this kind of situation before. Um, a Packy Webb comes to mind, uh, and I'm sure there are others that, that we have um, made it very clear to um, folks that are uh, stormwater too, yeah. Um, but there, we've made it very clear to, to folks um, that you're not supposed to go on test drives through neighborhoods. And I think that's been made abundantly clear to Bell Tire here tonight. Um, we've also seen other developments that have uh, you know, similar configurations um, that, uh, that prevent turns in the neighborhoods. And the, the, the one that jumped to mind uh, for me was fresh time. Um, the, the folks on Florence had similar concerns about traffic leaving uh, that store, turning south onto Florence and into the neighborhood. Um, there's a, a physical barrier as well as a sign just as is proposed here in this development and it's worked quite well. Um, I'm not aware of any complaints, perhaps we've received one or two, um, but they, they haven't made their way to the council. Um, and, um, you know, it, with regard to, you know, the, the noise and, and really the overall uh, use, I mean, it, Commissioner Gilmartin mentioned uh, uh, Firestone, Commissioner Tully mentioned Merlin. The, the two that came to mind for me were Car X and Cassidy Tire, which are also um, very close, if not directly adjacent to residential neighborhoods uh, and residential properties. So uh, by and large, um, I, I think the, the standards for the special uses are met. Um, I think the changes that were made between the plan commission and now mm -hmm. are crucial to that. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would have been a very close question as to whether I would feel the same way um, had the, uh, the petition that went to the plan commission come here. Um, but uh, I, I do think that the standards are met. Um, all of that said, I do appreciate the, the couple of mentions of gateway signs. We haven't talked about that in a while. Oh, it's so coming. We can, it's coming. Oh, all right. Oh, yes. all right. Um, any other comments from uh, the council with regard to this petition? Okay. Manager Fieldman? Thank you. The next item on tonight's first reading agenda is consideration of an ordinance amending Chapter 14 of our Municipal Code. Uh, this action, if approved, would codify temporary no parking restrictions approved under the Village Manager's Authority in three particular locations. The first is Drendel Road, just adjacent to the property that we were just speaking about. The second is at the um, newly constructed or recently constructed cul-de-sac on Wisconsin Avenue and uh, on Downers Drive, just south of Ogden. Be happy to answer any questions that the council may have. Thank you, Mr. Fieldman. Any questions from the council? Commissioner Tucks. Th thank you, Mayor Pro Time. Just to refresh my memory, how long is the temporary authority in place? Uh, in July, 180 days. Thank, thank you. you. Is the maximum. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Any questions or comment comments from the public? Hearing none. Next with, item, please. With the next item, we will invite Stan Popovich back to the podium to present information regarding 3300 Finley Road and their request to amend a planned unit development. Stan. Thank you, Manager Fieldman. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and Council Members once again. Can you get to that picture? This is when my uh, 
uh, animations don't pay off is trying to get through these real quick. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, tonight, uh, as Manager Fieldman know, this item is a request for a plan unit development to a PD, PUD number 57, which is 3300 Finley Road, uh, to add limited industrial uses as permitted uses and warehouse uses as special uses uh, per the petitioner's request. Property is uh, located uh, along Finley Road between I-88, I-355 and Finley Road. Uh, the site is the location of the former, former Fry's building. Property is zone B3 slash PUD. And it's adjacent to B3 to the no north, ORM, Office of Research Manufacturing, to the east, and then uh, I-88 and I-355 to the south and west, respectively. The petitioner is requesting an amendment to the PUD uh, to change and to allow different uses into uh, this district. The petitioner's request is a permitted use for limited industrial uses with conditions in a warehouse as a special use, uh, both within this PUD, so specifically to this PUD, uh, changing the uses that would be allowed in there. Uh, the staff and plan commission are recommending a light industrial as a special use with conditions, and staff and plan commission are recommending a warehouse with special use with required retail sales and conditions as well. The conditions are outlined in the staff report, uh, and these are the conditions, are, conditions are outlined in the uh, manager's memo in the ordinance, these are the conditions for limited industrial use, and these are the conditions for the uh, warehouse. The conditions are the same, uh, but for this must include retail sales on the warehouse. Comprehensive plan identifies the, the site as regional commercial uh, with visibility and access draws from regional customer base, uh, provides services, retail, and entertainment for daytime population, uh, prove the aesthetics of the site and strengthen the local economy by creating more jobs. Uh, the plan commission, uh, found that their recommendation, which is shown here, met the standards for approval found in section 12.040C.6 in the zoning ordinance and recommended approval of a limited industrial as a special use with conditions and warehouse as a special use with required retail sales and conditions as well. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have at this time. Uh, petitioner as well here, is here this evening as well, and they have, do have a presentation as well. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Stan. Would the petitioner like to uh, add anything to staff's presentation? Just a short piece of well. Please. Is it even populated or want to start it? Okay, great. Uh, good evening. Uh, for the record, my name is Andrew Scott. I'm with the law offices of Dykema Gossett, and I'm here on behalf of SCLP1 Downers Grove, LLC. Uh, they are the owners of the subject property, 3300 Finley Road. Uh, we brought our, our full team with us. Everybody came up from Florida, actually. We've got Joe Dykstra, Greg Fontella, and John Simard uh, with Sterling Organization. Sterling Organization, they are the affiliate parent company uh, of the applicant here. They are largely a uh, shopping center owner, but they have also gotten into the industrial warehouse last mile uh, business as well, and so that's why they've been looking at this site. Uh, we also have our broker with us this evening uh, with, from JLL, Dominic Carbonari. Uh, and just as a matter of background, we've worked with staff quite a bit over the last two years, uh, backing into this about two years ago. Um, uh, Sterling bought this site. Um, it was July of 2021. Uh, they have been trying for the past two years uh, to market this site to any and all types of users, uh, retail users, warehouse, uh, industrial uh, folks that would be interested in a site of this size. As you can see, and as Stan mentioned, uh, we're kind of nestled uh, in the crux of 355 and 88 just south of Butterfield Road. Um, the site, as you can see, uh, it's located, you know, well off of uh, the main retail drag here. And uh, frankly, with respect to your comprehensive plan, that's, that's where the real focus was of your comprehensive plan, was to try to build up Butterfield Road, talked about catalytic sites, uh, opportunities for redevelopment. It all occurred up here, and there was very little mention of any redevelopment opportunities or how sort of this area fit into these key areas of the, sit of the village uh, when it came to redevelopment. So as I mentioned, there's been an extensive effort uh, to attract tenants to, the particular, to this particular site. And really, just in terms of retail, uh, it's been a fail uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, as I mentioned, it's very much an isolated location. 
you know, retailers want to be with other retailers. They want to be along the main drag. And the site really doesn't fit it being down Finley Road, really isolated uh, from where all the retailers are. The other issue, uh, not a surprise to anyone, uh, retail is a very tough business these days. Uh, the, you know, there are big boxes that are looking to consolidate their spaces, mid boxes, same thing. They're being much more choosy about where they go. And so for a site like this, off the beaten path, it is just more and more difficult for it to uh, a retail use. And then finally, it, the, the interior, uh, while it worked well for Fry's and perhaps it worked well for its predecessor, AutoNation, uh, the, the building doesn't lay out very well for retail. There are not any 55,000, I'm sorry, 155,000 square foot users out there uh, that are looking to be in a location such as this. It's very, very difficult, if not cost prohibitive, to be able to demise the building to, to fit smaller retail. So it's really kind of a difficult building in order to populate, in order to get occupied uh, from a retail perspective. And then also when you look, I'm going to change and just give a little bit of context to the surrounding area. You can see uh, you're looking south now and you know it's surrounded by an office complex. We've got the IDOT terminal. You've got the, um, you know, the warehouse and fulfillment facility uh, down to the southwest. And then finally the hospital, you know, again, I said before, retailers want to be around retailers, and these, this area really doesn't fit the bill uh, from that perspective. So notwithstanding all of this, uh, you know, I, Sterling is bullish on the site. Uh, they like the site. They think it's got you know, a real opportunity uh, for activation, given the proximity to the interstates, and again, absence of uh, any kind of residential in the surrounding area. And so they have been looking and talking with, or, and their broker has been talking with, you know, a number of different types of businesses that would love to occupy this site. I mean, it, it's great because you've got the vis visibility and the access to the interstate. So there really are a large group of users that would like this site, but for the zoning and but for the limitations on the use that warehouse, light industrial uses of that nature are not permitted. And so, you know, that's why we're here today is to try to open up some of the uses, add them into the planned unit development that already governs the property to give us a better opportunity uh, to attract tenants, to get them to look at the site and let them know, I mean, I've done business in Downers Grove before, let them know that, uh, you know, let the, give the village the opportunity to shine, show how business friendly it is, how you know, easy it is to get building permits and it, it being a great environment. And the problem that we're having with the zoning and the reason that having warehouse as a special use and light industrial as a permitted use is so important is because again not a shock industrial warehouse notwithstanding everything that's going on the economy rising interest rates industrial and warehouse still continue to be a very very strong market and so there's a lot of demand and so you've got people out there that are looking for new facilities but the problem that we have is we might be competing with two, three, four other sites if we're able to get into the contest in the first place for somebody who is out in the marketplace. But they look at other sites where there may be a lesser quality building, there may not be the great access, they may, they may like this site a whole lot better. But when they look at a site in another municipality where there are, the zoning is in place, warehouses permitted, uh, they are able to kind of check the box and know that at least they're not going to have to go through a two to three to four uh, you know, entitlement process, building permit process before they're going to get up and running. And in short, the hyper competitive nature of this market may cause people to, they, they want to be into the space. If they're looking for a space, they want to be into their building. They don't want to lose out on an opportunity. And so we feel that we're losing out on opportunities and the village is losing out on opportunities to activate this property simply because there's so much competition in the marketplace and folks want to uh, be able to get into buildings quick and begin operating. So Stan had alluded to before uh, a number of conditions that are attached to uh, the different proposed uses, light industrial uh, and also warehouse, I'm sorry, light industrial and also warehouse uses. And we're in alignment with all of these conditions with the exception of two. Uh, let me start with the light industrial very quickly and maybe it's not a condition, but the, spe the designation of warehouse as a special use is problematic. 
Uh, we've heard a lot of allusions to you know why you know special uses versus permitted uses, uh, and you know what's the difference between the two. And really, it's contemplated that the use is allowed, but there may be attributes of a particular use that cause it to have you know a municipality is going to want to have a little bit more scrutiny over it. it there, there might be noise, there might be traffic. And from our perspective, limited industrial, the, the village's ordinance already defines limited industrial as those industrial uses, light industrial uses, that do not have negative externalities such as noise, excess traffic, light, things of that nature. So we feel like between the combinations of the conditions that, have already, that we've already agreed to and the definition of light industrial itself, it doesn't need to be an additional layer of a special use uh, overlay uh, in terms of that particular use. We feel like the controls are already in place to achieve what a special use would, would, al would allow for in the first place. And then second, uh, in terms of warehouse uses, again, we are in agreement with all of the conditions except for including retail sales. And that is, I mean, what we're trying to do right now is we are trying to crack open the door a little bit to try to get us in the running for different tenants that are out there that might be interested in this site. When you add in the requirement of it generating retail sales, there being retail sales, it effectively closes that door and makes it even more difficult to attract warehouse tenants. Uh, a lot of warehouse tenants, it's not in their nature to have retail sales. I mean, we're, we're, we very much limited the universe by require, by uh, adding that addition, that contingency in. And you also have a problem because it's, it's a little bit of an incompatibility between the uses. I mean, you've got warehouse that's got truck traffic, you've got consumers coming to the space, and again, it, it's really difficult from a compatibility standpoint. So between, you know, trying to find that needle in the haystack that of somebody that's a warehouse but also has some level of retail use, makes it very, very difficult. So while we felt like we took a couple steps forward in terms of generating the conversation about limited industrial and warehouse, the addition of uh, sales taxes as a, as a condition kind of causes us to take one step back. And so that's really why, again, we're in full agreement after a lot of discussion with village staff about sort of what the conditions are that would attach to these two uh, uses. But again, making limited industrial special use makes it much more difficult, again, for the reasons that I talked about because of the, the timing associated with it. Retail sales makes it very, very difficult to find a user out there. Uh, and so for those reasons, uh, again, I'm sorry, let me just point out too, just in terms of compatibility of the uses, I mean, <clears throat> you see the site uh, at kind of in the middle, there's kind of a finger of the B3 uh, that goes down off of Butterfield, but really we are in a strong ORM area, uh, both to the uh, east and the west, and you know, you do have the uses that we're seeking to use, so there is compatibility uh, between the uses that we're proposing and the surrounding uh, zoning classifications. The other nice thing about this in terms of the proposed uses is that we're well segregated uh, from residential uses. So we're not going to have you know, some of the problems that you all just talked about with the Bell Tire use uh, because we don't have neighbors and we've, you know, we've agreed to conditions uh, that will seek to uh, ameliorate any negative externalities on the businesses that are already there. I mean, we want to be a good neighbor. Uh, so that's, uh, we feel like that has been taken care of. And just as a last matter, I mean, I think one of the issues that we ran across uh, that was hard for the plan commission to get around was one of the standards and how we met it. And that's the one that talks about, if you'll bear with me for a sec, sort of what are the, what are the greater or more equal to benefits that come from a planned unit development designation here than if you were to just stick with the underlying zoning. And I think what we've come to realize and what we've seen by being out in the marketplace over the past two years is that retail development is, is very, very unlikely to come here. And so that means there's going to be a, I mean, if we stick with retail, that means, and you stick with the underlying zoning without sort of the relief that we're seeking here, you're very, very likely not going to see redevelopment of this site. And it's going to sit and it's going to be vacant and it's not going to be sort of the highest and best use. It's not going to be contributing to your real estate tax base. 
and it, it's going to just it, it's not going to do any good to anybody. And so that compared with what do you get if we're able to put a retail use in, I'm sorry, if we're able to put a warehouse use or light industrial use in this property is that there are benefits that go above and beyond than what would happen under the current zoning. Again, nothing would happen, or our, our opinion is that nothing would happen under the current zoning from a retail perspective, but you get jobs, you get enhancement of the real estate tax base, you ideally have a uh, you ideally have a business that inures to the benefit of uh, of your residents and of your constituents, and so we appreciate the consideration and uh, we we're available to answer any questions. Thank you. I'll start with the council. Any questions or comments to start, Commissioner Gilmartin? Thank you. Um, you mentioned that there has been some interest in the property from a number of parties, um, yet the the zoning is is not allowing. Or what? I'm wondering if you could share with us just generally what types of industries or that, that are showing interest in this, so we can get a, a sense of what we're what you're talking about sure absolutely and I'd actually like to bring up our That's broker because uh, I think yeah you know, he's he's the guy perfect face of the I appreciate face of the that property. yes good evening everyone Dominic Carbonari I'm with JLL uh, so last 24 months we've just been we've cleaned up the interior we have a plan for the exterior but that gets kind of dictated by the, what do you want it to look like, Mr. Operator? Mm -hmm. The retail component has kind of been the Achilles heel the entire time because as this corridor goes, as you know, it's a lot of medium and small big box. All the retailers that need to be here want to be here. We're seeing third party logistics firms that just kind of want to throughput goods. Mm -hmm. We're seeing packaging groups. We'll apply, you know, we'll employ people locally. We'll bring jobs to the area. But again, they're going to need four or 5,000 feet of office space, kind of a typical use for mm -hmm. the marketplace today. This marketplace has just shifted so incredibly since COVID. We're looking at ways to reevaluate and readapt different types mm -hmm. of facilities that are out there today. And the location is attractive. And users want to be here because they're not stuck in the traffic in Bolingbrook, and they're not stuck up by O'Hare Airport, mm -hmm. and they're not in Cook County. So, the operators you're seeing, you know, are just more of that traditional kind of light user, throughput user, nothing staying there very long, kind of turning over in like, you know, two to three weeks. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Tully. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I appreciate your dilemma. Um, I remember when uh, this was fallow and fries came along a long time ago, so I'm very, familiar with the challenges of this property, but also the advantages of it. Um, I'm a little hesitant though, because I also recall in 2008, 2009, some decisions were made because the economy was terrible and some things were approved that I think later we regretted. Um, and I know there's no proposal in front of us right now for any particular use. Um, I also recall that there was a uh, contaminated junkyard on Ogden Avenue that we never thought was going to be redeveloped. And today it's a Packy Web car dealership. So part of me uh, believes in patience in the long game, and also I uh, have a great deal of confidence in our Economic Development Corporation working with, uh, with property owners. So while I appreciate the challenges, I'm, I'm not quite fully convinced. Um, I would be willing to meet you halfway. Um, my thinking is that um, I, could, I, could, I could be convinced on the elimination of the re retail sales requirement, but um, Given the discussion that we just had in here and the importance of our special use authority, I am very reluctant to make the light industrial a permitted use, but would want to keep that as a special use. Um, I think you've got a good idea of how this council treats special uses, and if it was something we were all very in favor of, um, I think we'll deal with that very expeditiously. But I think we would prefer to have that ability to, if warranted to add conditions or restrictions to whatever that use might be. So I'd be in favor of, of basically meeting you halfway. I don't know what, I don't know what my colleagues think. <laughs> okay. 
Commissioner Sosky, if you could. Yeah, as I was running notes as we were having those discussions, I, I am kind of in a similar place as Commissioner Tully. Um, I, I think we, we need to be able to have the flexibility of maintaining that special use with conditions um, in, in both cases. Um, I would be interested to hear a little bit more about if there are examples of that the, the uses with retail sales kind of in the in the area. You know, anecdotally, you, you think of things like the, like the Pepperidge Farm warehouses that used to have a retail space or things like that, and those have kind of been been done away with. I mean, even where I grew up, I'm originally from Ohio in the western suburbs of Cleveland, and we used to have some out, out that way as well, and they they pretty much have all gone by the wayside. We had an Entenmann's factory over there. Um, but I, I don't think that I could get behind anything that would not maintain that, that special use condition in, in either category. So I'd like to hear about potentially more examples if we do have that's really it, Commissioner. The examples you gave was the line of thinking with yeah, the village yeah. staff and EDC staff. Yeah. But kind of maybe where those where those examples are going and what okay. you know if if they if we're seeing them actually persist. Because again, anecdotally, I kind of see that they're they don't necessarily tend to be doing particularly well. But um, yeah, as of now, I I lean towards that. I, I could deal with meeting halfway, but I I don't think that I could do away with the special use in either either case. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Davenport. Sure. Um, if we were to go forward with this, I'm in agreement. Uh, the special use would need to apply to both. Um, I am. I'm. Con this almost seems to me like an argument has been made more that we should be looking at rezoning the property. Maybe it's. It, maybe there, there. Maybe there's a, a conversation about whether or not this should be ORM. Um, I'm concerned that if we if we grant a special use in this B3, how precedential this might be. Mm -hmm. um, and, and knowing that this will live with the property too. Yeah. So, so this, is, um, this property has some unique qualities that the petitioners pointed out, especially when they had their aerial photo and surrounding mm -hmm. land uses. So from the staff perspective, we think most or all of the B3 regulations are appropriate here but only some of the ORM regulations would be appropriate here. And the PUD itself allows us that type of flexibility to tailor the zoning ordinance applications mm -hmm. to a certain property without setting precedent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. you know, I, I'm comforted by the fact that we're only talking about potentially modifying the PUD as opposed to the, the underlying zoning yeah. um, for exactly those reasons. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, when you look around the, the various uses, you've got the the export, you've got some office space, you've got a hotel very nearby, right. um, and for all those reasons, industrial and warehouse just feel kind of out of place to me. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm I'm also unwilling to give up the the special use. Um, in fact, I would probably go farther than the plan commission at this point. I'm not really ready to give up the ghost on the, the retail component in the in the warehouse, and I would put it on the limited industrial too. Um, so it doesn't sound like there's much of an appetite for that from from some of my colleagues, but that's where I'm at. Um, but I, I think we absolutely have to have the special use. Any other comments, questions? I would just second you. I think the retail component is uh, a piece that I would still want to see. Um, barring an understanding of sort of who else might be looking at that type of who else might be looking at that type of property with, with without it um, I, I think I would I think the special use also gives us an opportunity to maybe even reshape some of the entrances and so that export is walled off if, if it, it does become something that isn't retail based but that's further down the path as, as things go but I, I too, I mean, I think the special use is important for us to have and, you know, look, I, I want to see that site develop as much as, as anybody. I think as a council, we would look for ways to help as much as we can there. Um, but to Commissioner Tully's point, we do have to have a, a long view on some of this stuff and I'm um, not quite sure we're, we're there yet. So I think that's it. Thanks. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it just goes without saying, I'd prefer to have the retail mm -hmm. component in there, no question about it, but uh, I think with the, 
the ability, we're, we're moving that, opens it up to other things that would generate a, uh, a win-win for both the landowner as well as the community. And I want to be open to that, and that's so I'm comfortable removing that restriction. Of course, I'd prefer to have a retail component, no question about it. Uh, but I think the special use and the PUD combination gives us enough ability to um, collaborate on future solutions, which is really what I'm getting at is, uh, of course, we're as interested in anybody as, as, as getting this property uh, as productive as possible and then putting it at its highest and best use. But um, history is a teacher. That's all I'm saying. Okay. I think that's all we've got. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. The next item on tonight's first reading agenda is an ordinance authorizing the village to borrow funds from the IEPA as part of their public water supply loan program. This is a low interest loan program that the village has been using since about 2015. It allows us to borrow money at below market interest rates and invest that money into improvements into our water system, particularly water main replacements. Be happy to answer any questions the council may have. Any questions from the council? Commissioner Tilly? Not a question, just thank you for saving us money. Thank you. Anyone else? Anything from the public? Yeah, I'd just like to say also thank you for, for saving us money. And uh, I, I can remember talking about this, thinking about economic development at the, the Grunfos. Um, it's hard to call it groundbreaking when you're like on the third floor or fourth floor or whatever. It was like wall breaking um, when uh, then Governor Quinn started bending my ear about this project and or this uh, this possibility. And um, so I brought it back to staff, and a couple of years later, here we are. Um, I'm glad it's working out. It's working out quite well for us. Well, uh, if this ordinance passes, we'll continue to pursue that loan application. Thank you. And finally tonight on our first reading is consideration of an agreement with ALAMP Concrete Contractors for a stormwater project improvement. And here to present information on this item is our Assistant Director of Public Works on the engineering side of the house, uh, Scott Vasco. Good evening, Scott. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Council and Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, tonight I'm going to be presenting uh, the Sherwood and Chicago Drainage Improvements Project. So the project includes approximately 1,900 feet of 12 inch and 15 inch storm sewer on Chicago from Linden to Sherwood and on Sherwood from Chicago to Grant. We'll also be including the installation of V-type gutters on Sherwood, roadway patching on Chicago and resurfacing in Sherwood. The project was bid in April. We had three bids received. ALAP Concrete Contractors was a low bid at $1,188,431. ALAMP has done numerous uh, storm sewer and water main projects throughout the village and they've been successful with all the project. Mm -hmm. The work is scheduled to occur uh, between June and September of this year. Uh, this, this final slide I'm going to show you is uh, just a couple examples of areas where the village has used V-type gutter mm -hmm. in the past. Uh, the top photo is from Linden Place in 2019 and the bottom is from Davis in 2011. And with that, I'll take any questions you might have. Thank you, Scott. Any questions or comments from the council? Just a quick one. Mr. Kilmartin. Can you just, um, for my edification, explain the advantages to using the V-shaped gutter? Uh, a couple of the reasons we looked at doing the V-shaped gutter is the topography of the street right now, the natural flow of the drainage takes it to the edge of the pavement. Mm -hmm. uh, so with the V-shaped gutter, we, we felt like we could get the, to convey the water to the new storm sewer better. Uh, and it'll protect the road edge a little bit better out there. So that's the reason for it. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, before we, uh, in, if, unless there's any other questions on this one. Yes. Uh, uh, well, no. I'm sorry. Was there <laughs> anything else? No. Any questions or comments from the public? And with that, I just okay. wanted to circle back. Thanks, uh, Scott, for the mm -hmm. presentation. Um, it, we've learned that there may be another uh, uh, request for a public comment on the 3300 oh. Finley Road. I apologize. And just wanted to bring that to your attention, Mayor Pro Tem, if that is your wish. Sure. If, if there's anything else on the uh, A lamp? No? Okay. Let's jump back. I apologize. Thank you. Did I miss something? There was no input from the audience. No, I probably got ahead of myself. Why don't you come on down? <laughs> right now, they're gone. I have questions right now. Okay. No, they're still there. I 
Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Scott Richards. I live at 1130 Warren Avenue here in Downers. Uh, the uh, first time this came, petition came up on the, to the Planning Commission, I was there, sat through that. Uh, leaving that meeting, I couldn't figure out what just happened. Uh, I had put several questions out to them. I didn't get any response from the petitioner or any of our committee people that I brought questions up I thought were important. I'm going to throw them at you again. Uh, first of all, I'd like to know what type of truck traffic is this thing going to generate? How much traffic? Is it going to be limited hours? Is it going to be 24 hours? What kind of impact is it going to have on Finley traffic? We know Finley is a very busy street and there's never been any talk about whatsoever. What kind of trucks are we talking about? What kind of schedule? How many? Yet the board, the plan commission, first of all, they didn't have the votes in the beginning of the meeting. Even the chairman had reserva reservations about it. Then one of, the, one of the people on the board got together and said, let's just talk this over. They got their heads together in the meeting and tweaked it enough that they could change the verbiage on this petition. And so then they passed it. None of this that I'm bringing up was ever mentioned. And I thought, well, how do you vote some, on something and pass it and you don't even know what the darn thing's going to be. And I just, I, wa I walked out of here, I'm thinking, what in the heck are we doing? But I'd like to know, I'd like to throw these questions out again. I'd like to know something about this petition and what's, what's it going to, uh, how much traffic, for one thing. What's it going to do to our, our friendly, especially? Are we going to have overflow onto our Butterfield corridor or Ogden corridor? What are we talking about? They, they haven't disclosed anything about the number of trucks, how many, what hours. Why not? And why aren't we asking these questions? Well, I think the answer to that is that we don't know yet. Um, what we're talking about here is a change to the PUD, which yeah. is the underlying zoning that affects the property. Right now, they don't have uh, the zoning, so they can't market it in those categories just yet. Then how which come means they can't go get an end user that we could then measure the traffic, measure the impact on stormwater, measure all of these other things you're talking okay. about. But my question, especially for the plan commission, you voted to move it on, but you didn't have anything to base your vote on. I don't get it. I'm, I'm missing something here. I would want to know the details of what I'm voting for. Well, it's because zoning questions are a little more amorphous than that. Uh, okay. When you're looking at the underlying zoning, you're looking at what they're requesting, you're looking at the market, you're looking at other uh, properties around and what the surrounding zoning is, among other things. Um, once we have all of that, and th this really goes to the discussion of the special use, um, if a special use is in place, they would have to come back and make application for one of those uses, in which case we're going to ask questions like, Good. what's the traffic impact going to be, what's the stormwater impact going to so. be, and all the rest of these. Yeah, because, I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't vote on anything unless I know what I'm voting for. Yep. Uh, the last meeting, I know they had mentioned uh, it, it, it didn't meet two of the village's guidelines, six of the guidelines, it didn't meet that. Uh, and let's just kick this retail. They keep pushing retail. Well, that, there's really that. I don't think re, uh, retail, at least right now, it's really not an option. But a warehouse, are we really willing to waste 16 acres for another warehouse just south of our corridor, Butterfield Road? And they talk like it's like miles away. No, it is not. It's just south of Butterfield, our, one of our main corridors for commercial and, and uh, corporate. Once Butterfield is built out, which it's getting there, the next avenue to me would be Finley, going down Finley Road, going south. We've already got restaurants on it. We've got a hotel on it. I mean, it's not like some isolated uh, you know, piece of property. And I just can't imagine using that 16 acres and waste it on a warehouse. I just I don't see the point of it. I, it there's other uses it could be looked into. Uh, it, we could be a corporate headquarters, multi-story housing. We could look at to as residential, a hotel, a conference center. There's so many other options if we actually went out and tried to find something. Why do we always take the first thing that comes up all the time? We have a tendency to do that this, in this town. I see it over and over. Every time we get a petition, it's, that's the one. That's the one. And I just I thought, what in the heck? And I'd just like to see us start doing things with what's best for the community rather than what's best for the developer. 
And I'm just, I, a lot of people in town feel the same way I do. I, I'm not just here, you know, the only one that's, but the, the attitude in town, people are getting fed up. Anyway, I'll, I'll let you soak on that for a while. Thank you. Thank you. Since we reopened public comment, why don't we reopen the council real quick? Commissioner Tully? <laughs> I, I, I was I was resisting it, but thank you, Mayor Bertem. Uh, I, I just wanted to clarify that you didn't miss anything, sir, because there wasn't anything to miss. All they asked for was to change the, the size of the box that they might propose something in the future. That's all. So there wasn't anything to vote on in terms of a proposal. And uh, and candidly, what what I heard my colleague say is that uh, we, we the warehouse use that was requested shouldn't be automatic. It should be something that if they bring one that maybe even you would like, we should have the opportunity to consider that because it might be a good thing, but we don't want it to be automatic. At least that's what some of us up here said. Uh, so yes. uh, shockingly, we're, we're kind of aligned with what you just said. Thank you, Commissioner. Sorry. Yeah, it's really a matter of um, making sure the, the horse and the cart are in the right order, and right now I think they are. Mr. Fieldman, anything else on the uh, first reading? Uh, nothing at all. That ends our first reading tonight, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Thank you. I will go right back to you for the manager's report. And I will hand it off to uh, both of our, uh, two of our valued partners in economic development. Uh, I'll start with a quarterly report from the Economic Development Corporation. I'd like to introduce uh, Brian Gay, who heads up that organization. Good evening, Brian. Whoa. Good evening. <laughs> Not quite yet. Walk up music. Perfect. 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 Mayor Pro Tem, uh, trustees, uh, it's great to be back uh, up in front of you tonight. Uh, we're going to do things a little bit different. Um, you know, in the past, this has always been kind of a uh, data narrative uh, intensive. Uh, uh, presence, uh, presentation for myself as well as my predecessor and tonight uh, we're going to be presenting for majority of our report our uh, first ever annual uh, key performance indicator report this is a video that we uh, produced in-house here to kind of tell that story a little bit better from a from a visual perspective and something that again we want to uh, you know really present these numbers uh, as, a, as a bigger story and just kind of have a little bit more glitz and glamour to it so uh, with that I'll ask uh, Mike to play right. that. Uh, we know we don't have sound. I'm hopeful we'll get the visual as well. <laughs> because I was juggling PowerPoint presentations before, it seems to be locked into PowerPoint mode. So let me see what I can do here. The, the sound is great, but the pictures are even better. <laughs> so. <laughs> We're going to call an audible and give Mike an opportunity to deal with some technical stuff. Okay. Stuff, if it's all right, go with the council. Let's maybe try a downtown management. Report. You don't want to maybe narrate what we were supposed to see, <laughs> and then uh, we'll come back to uh, Brian in a minute if that's all right with the mayor. Mm -hmm. That's totally fine. Okay. Good evening, Aaron. We are experiencing technical difficulties. I, I love the new button. branding theme. Imagine. Yes. <laughs> well, the good news is uh, we have distributed Aaron's presentation to the council in advance. So if the council would like to follow along uh, with those visuals, we'll turn it over to you. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and Council. My name is Aaron Venezia, and I am the Executive Director for Downtown Downers Grove Management Corporation. Downtown Downers Grove Special Service Area Number 11 is home to approximately 280 businesses. We continue to maintain a first floor occupancy rate of approximately 98%. We have welcomed seven new businesses so far in 2023. Bentley Irish Dancers at 926 Warren Avenue, Bonilla Psychotherapy in the DG Commons at 5117 Main Street, Capetta's West Suburban Funeral Home at 4920 Main Street, Custom Cabinet Connection at 1013 Maple Avenue, the Grove Realtors Group at 1007 Curtis Street, Pound Cake Bakery at 5228 Main Street, and Pro Air Heating, Cooling, Electric in the DG Commons at 5117 Main Street. We also had one of our businesses recently expand. Adorn 512 has expanded into their neighbor's space, which was previously occupied by PG Headshots. We will soon welcome the following new businesses. Bonita Bowls at 4956 Main Street, Costello Jewelry at 5117 Main Street, 
a dining establishment by the name of 1126 at 5126 Main Street, Luku Madness, which is offering mini Greek donuts with lots of different toppings at 5129 Main Street, Solana Aesthetics at 5143 Mokul Drive, and Tough Coat Showroom and Office at 4927 Main Street. Dash Downers Grove is located at 926 Maple Avenue. They have started to welcome their first residents and Downtown Management Corporation offered our downtown businesses the opportunity to place a promotional item or coupon into welcome bags for the new residents. Our office purchased the bags and stuffed 167 of them with items from more than 35 of our downtown businesses. We have sold more than $9,000 in downtown Downers Grove gift cards from January through April, which is a great gift to keep in mind for moms, dads, grads, and teachers. The downtown had 332,000 unique visitors, equaling more than 1.1 million visits to the downtown from January 1st to April 30th. This number is up 12% from 2019 and 3.6% since 2022. In January, we worked with Green Star Papery to create a new fine arts lo logo. We revealed this logo just in time to open our applications for the Fine Arts Festival, which will be held September 9th through the 10th, 2023. The applications recently closed and we sent our acceptance letters. We are excited for the Fine Arts Festival this September and have received the most applications that we have received for as far back as I can remember while the organization has been running the Fine Arts Festival. February 3rd through the 5th, we held our annual ice festival we had a record-breaking 66 ice sculptures. We were excited to bring back the addition of ice games this year, such as Bozo Buckets. ABC7 News reported from downtown Downers Grove, highlighting the ice festival on a freezing Friday afternoon. Saturday brought much warmer temperatures, which was great for those that wanted to get out of the house and enjoy the sculptures. However, the warmer temperatures and sunshine were not great for the longevity of the ice sculptures. <laughs> we did have the live carvings from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the Main Street train station, Saturday and Sunday. A fun fact from this year was that it was the first year we had all female ice carvers performing the live carvings. Mm. Candy Cane Cash Rewards expired February 28th. We have reimbursed nearly $1,200 at the rewards that were distributed and businesses are still redeeming these to our office. In March, we held our spring break downtown Downers Grove. A handful of downtown businesses highlighted different activities to keep kids of all ages busy that were in the area for spring break. The activities ranged from yoga to painting to board games to an escape room at the library. Downtown Management Corporation kicked off our butterfly hunt that week, and the butterfly hunt ran through April 16th. A butterfly was hidden in the windows of 35 businesses. Participants would stroll through the downtown, spotting each butterfly and finding what made it unique. All ages love this hunt around the downtown, and it's a great reason to get out of the house in the spring and explore downtown Downers Grove. Downers Grove Downtown Management Corporation launched a Warhol poster contest for children and adults this spring or winter. The winners will receive a gift card to downtown Downers Grove, and we'll have their entries made into posters to display through downtown. The winners will be announced later this week and will be on display starting in June. Our annual Shop, Sip, and Stroll Wine Walk had a sellout crowd of 350 participants and sold out in under two hours. The attendees represented 25 different zip codes. We had 20 businesses participating as wine stops and two businesses participating as snack and water stops. We split the check-in between three locations, which helped spread the crowd around the downtown. The businesses and the attendees that participated loved the event. A great event for exposure to new customers. The attendees were surveyed after the event, and of those that responded, 80% discovered <coughs> new to them businesses, 90% of the respondents purchased at a retailer that evening, and 60% ate dinner at a downtown restaurant. Friday Night Live starts on May 26th, the live entertainment will be from 5.30 to 8 p.m. and will change weekly, and this will run through September 1st, with the exception of June 23rd due to Rotary Grow Fest. This will run in conjunction with the Downers Grove Moose Cruise Nights. The Moose Cruise Nights will be held from 4 to 8 p.m. on Warren Avenue between Forest and Main and in parking lot A. The Moose Lodge has partnered with a different not-for-profit each week, and they are asking a suggested donation of $10 a car. We were happy to work with GRIT2 and Navigate Adolescents to help spread the word on Mental Health Awareness Month to our downtown businesses. Downtown Downers Grove is host to events that are sponsored by other organizations as well, two of which will start this month. The Indian Boundary YMCA Downtown Market begins this Saturday, May 13th, and the Downers Grove Park District Summer Concert Series starts May 23rd. Another community favorite will be returning in a few weeks. We'll be kicking off our Loyal to Local program on June 5th. 
You can be rewarded for supporting local this summer. We'll have a weekly drawing for two $50 downtown gift cards, and in September, we will do the grand prize drawing. The grand prize will be made up of gift cards and items from all participating businesses. Last year, the grand prize was over $1,000. I look forward to seeing you all shopping, dining, and enjoying downtown throughout this summer. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Downtown is always the, the heart of our community, and it's so much fun to see all of the different activities that are going on. So thank you for the report, Erin. Were there any questions at all from the council? Okay. After the uh, little um, kind of report on why we love the idea that we're going to have a new village hall soon, um, <laughs> Brian, back to you. All right. Okay, so again, as I said, uh, we had the world premiere of this video back in March, shortly after uh, we last met in February. Uh, this uh, video is posted up on our website, and unfortunately, due to the reporting nature of just all the different numbers that go into this, we're only able to do it on a quarterly basis, but uh, hopefully, uh, uh, within the next few weeks here, we'll have uh, full numbers for those numbers that come out on a quarterly basis. But uh, for the most part, though, this is our uh, this is our annual KPI report for 2022. see a lot of information packed uh, in a very graphically pleasing uh, you know presentation there um, typically we'd like to keep these uh, presentations to a minute and a half or less and then we can kind of snip these things up into different vignettes uh, over a couple different uh, bite-sized pieces there but uh, some numbers to kind of call out there so as you saw um, we had kind of a distinction between projects and then like permitted things so uh, the projects are uh, ours what we uh, our projects are defined as uh, fulfilling two of three categories i think as we've mentioned this in the past these are either projects that had one million dollars of uh, of capital investment they created 25 new jobs or 25,000 uh, square feet of either industrial office or retail space were consumed uh you know for that to happen so two of those three triggers in that case last year we had 11 projects uh, that totaled 51 million uh, 51.7 million dollars 300 jobs created 907,000 square feet consumed within the marketplace. And then to date here in 2023, uh, today we've had five projects so far, $7.4 million in about 127,000 uh, square feet consumed between retail office and industrial. So uh, we are somewhat ahead of the game here in terms of the number of projects and, and inquiries that we're seeing in the village. Uh, however, you know we're still trying to make up for those new jobs created and uh, kind of catching up uh, with the total investment in that uh, space consumed. Uh, some other uh, numbers that we've been able to kind of update since this video here. So uh, in December in Downers Grove, we had a 2.7% uh, unemployment uh, right here in the village. Uh, today, uh, just ticked a little, uh, just uh, 0.1 lower, so we're at 2.6 for, uh, for the month of March. And then DuPage County uh, in total went from 3.0 to 3.1 here in March. So a slight tick up countywide in terms of those numbers. Uh, so again, we're, we're trending in all the right directions 
projections here is we're seeing um, a lot of those uh, uh, those numbers in industrial real estate, those uh, vacancy rates continue to fall here. It's a very, very tight market here, which again um, is a good thing and a bad thing. Good thing in that we have low vacancy. Bad thing is that there's not a whole lot of opportunity in terms of large spaces uh, and land that's uh, available for redevelopment here. So, uh, but again, we're continuing to, to monitor this and again, uh, the economy in general is, uh, is very strong within the village of Downers Grove. Um, with that, the last thing I did want to report on that is not in these numbers here is if, I think if you remember I, uh, back in January I announced that uh, the Downers Grove EDC was uh, named a community navigator uh, with the state of Illinois to help promote and encourage uh, businesses to apply for the back to business grant. Uh, that grant ends tomorrow night at midnight so for any businesses watching here please if you're an arts business, if you're a hotel or if you're a restaurant within the state of Illinois and you haven't applied for these funds yet, please go to uh, illinois.gov forward slash B2B and apply for those grants here today uh, before the deadline ends again tomorrow evening at midnight. Um, since March 1, when we really kind of kicked this whole project into high gear here, uh, our business uh, our, bus our uh, business navigator uh, staff at the Downers Grove EDC, uh, we've, uh, we've met with over 300 businesses within uh, the village of uh, Downers Grove. Uh, most of those have all been restaurants, our hotels, and then uh, what are considered our arts businesses. So these are 300 new touch points we've had within the village. And uh, our consultants, uh, Lisa Raisin and Barb Wysocki, along with Lisa Winslow and myself, we've consulted with businesses in over 200 hours, just helping them uh, talk with them, meeting with them, talking about resources, not just through back to business, but through workforce development through the state of Illinois, a lot of different programs. So we've had amazing feedback, amazing touch points. And again, this uh, program, the back to, uh, back to business, as well as Community Navigator, has allowed us this opportunity to get out there into, the, into our uh, local uh, business uh, economy and you know, just again talking about good things that are happening here as well as the state of Illinois. So um, I can also say that as of this afternoon at like three o'clock um, we've had 30 completed applications within uh, between restaurants and our arts businesses and I think we have about 70 or so uh, pending applications that are still need to be completed. So again if you haven't completed it you're watching at home get on your computer right now and, f and finish your back to business grant. So with that, I'd answer any questions you guys have. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. The, the partnership between the village and the EDC has been tremendously beneficial, and we sincerely <coughs> appreciate all the work that you and the entire board do uh, on behalf of our village. Thanks. A couple of the numbers that jumped out to me were the 2.6% the unemployment, which is essentially full employment uh, in the village, and then um, $50 million in private investment in just the project category. Um, it's, a, it, it's a heck of a number. Um, and I, I want to make sure that we get a plug out there for your annual luncheon that's coming up on Thursday. Yes. Um, I hope the uh, event is a great success. Yeah, thank you. Any uh, any questions or comments from my colleagues? Commissioner Sadowski, if you could. Yeah, I just have uh, a couple quick questions. There was one, I feel like, and this is one that I, I feel like has always kind of plagued us. There was one occupancy rate that was, I think it was like 90%, and it went too quickly that I think was a little bit lower, right, than the corridor average. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that and and what that reference is and if we're trending in the right direction with that one? So across the board, whether it's uh, industrial, vac uh, industrial vacancies as well as office uh, occupancies, uh, we're doing really well. I mean, for most part, um, our, office uh, our office vacancy rate is well below uh, east-west corridor averages. Uh, our neighbors are typically seven to eight points higher than we okay. currently are right now. And then that industrial vacancy rate there, we're right, you know, right where we should be from that standpoint. Yeah. Retail, again, we don't have the, the large uh, super regional malls that uh, you see in our neighbors here, uh, but from that standpoint, we're well in line and actually maybe even a tick lower than uh, some of our other neighbors. So Great. we're doing well. And then my only other question is, um, you know, I know the hotels, we are, at, thank goodness, at a good increase from 2021, so we're definitely trending. Can you give us an idea of where we are now as compared to pre-pandemic levels, the 2019-ish era? So right now we are either on par or actually slightly better than our 2019 numbers here, okay, so that, that is, is great. Um, I believe our last quarter of 22 was the strongest we had had since uh, well before pandemic times, and I think the... Um, 
the the village can verify this i think that the best year we've ever had was early 2000s here and so we were we were underneath that but again we're, we're punching Excellent. well above where that, it should be so that is very great news yeah. so thank you so much for all your hard work oh, thank you thank you any other questions or comments Mr. just Gilbert. a comment um i think uh, selling yourself a little short on the community navigator <laughs> as a consultant um yeah so i'm at the opportunity to see firsthand this uh, opportunity brought to us, Brian and his team have been extremely, uh, um, uh, in their outreach, they've been ex extremely effective. It's not just consulting businesses coming in, but they've been outreaching to all the businesses that fit this category for these grants. Um, I know firsthand, as I found out about it, I reached out to a number of people that I thought were qualified and they had already been reached out to by your team. Um, but to see that as an opportunity to help our businesses to also be a great resource for our neighbors as well, mm -hmm. since it wasn't just Downers Grove that we were helping through this, it was DuPage County mm -hmm. and, and even beyond. So um, I just wanna give you you and your team kudos for that. Thank and you. Um, you know, these are the kinds of things we look to our EDC to, to bring beyond just sort of attracting businesses, but also being uh, good advocates and stewards for those businesses. And, and I appreciate you and, and your team for all that hard work. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, to, uh, to uh, trustee's point, uh, we hosted, uh, so while from an economic development standpoint, we cover all of, Dupay, uh, all of Downers Grove, but through the Navigator program, we do as one of the only community navigators in the entire county of DuPage County, um, we, we did as much outreach as we could uh, across the county here. And so we actually held two countywide uh, webinars, one with uh, partnered with the Small Business Development Center at College of DuPage, as well as Choose DuPage, uh, and then the DuPage uh, Convention and Visitors Bureau. And then we did one specifically with the uh, Convention and Visitors Bureau to hit to uh, specifically hit those arts uh, businesses within DuPage County as well as our hotel so I think in both cases we had close to a hundred uh, attendees uh, registrations were well uh, above that as well and so a lot of information got out there so thank you for, yep. for mm -hmm. uh, noticing. Commissioner Tully. Thank you Mayor Pro Tem and Brian thank you very much for the presentation um, love the graphics very uplifting inspiring so nice job on that uh, I've asked you this question before, so I'll, I'll ask it again because I have to. Uh, according to the Wall Street Journal, is a storm of distress coming for Class A office space. I know we're doing better than others. Does that mean, looking into your crystal ball, that we will be doing less worse than our neighbors? Or where do, where do you see that going? So I think, uh, you know, again, right now we're doing better than, than most of our neighbors. But I think, as, as we've discussed in the past, uh, a lot of this is due to the timing of when leases are becoming uh, you know, coming due and everything like that. Um, I, I will give a, a tip of the cap to a lot of our uh, to a lot of our building owners, our real estate owners. Um, they were ahead of the game here in that you know a lot of. Uh, uh, class A office spaces were willing to kind of weather the storm and kind of play it out uh, as is, whereas a lot of uh, here in Downers Grove, we've seen significant upgrades to amenities and spaces uh, here. And so that way, keeping those class A office spaces who are staying class A office spaces where we've seen some of our neighbors kind of tick below that and to be uh, B plus spaces and some of them even gone down to C. So um, I believe that, you know, looking at my crystal ball, I believe that we're going to be able to weather the storm uh, a little bit better but again uh, as those long-term leases continuously uh, you know come up for renewals and everything like that it's just something we're gonna have to to keep a watch on so okay. thank you yep. thank you Brian thank you and, and many thanks to you and to Aaron again we are very fortunate in Downers Grove to have two wonderful partner organizations in the EDC and the downtown management corporation so thank you for all you do here here before I end the manager's report, I do want to continue with that theme of uh, recognizing great work. You know, uh, I want to take a minute and thank uh, Mike and Doug for keeping the AV stuff going. It's yeah. harder than it looks, <laughs> and that was a great recovery, and we depend on them so much, and they do a great job every week. So thanks, mm -hmm. Mike, and thanks, Doug. And with that, that ends the uh, manager's report, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fielding. That brings us to item nine, the attorney's report. Ms. Petrarch. Yes, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Four items to present tonight. The first is an ordinance approving a special use for 2539 Ogden Avenue to permit a personal vehicle repair and maintenance business, an ordinance amending chapter 14 of the municipal code, an ordinance approving an amendment to plan unit development number 57 to add limited industrial use in warehouse as an allowed special use at 3300 Finley Road, 
and an ordinance authorizing the village to borrow funds from the IEPA, all of which will be on next week's active agenda. Thank you, Mayor Porto. Thank you. Item 10 is public comments. This is an opportunity to raise items of concern or other issues um, from the public that are not on tonight's agenda. Obviously, most of tonight's agenda is already gone. Um, we've also found that most of our public is already gone. Um, <laughs> any other comments? All right. That brings us to item 11, the mayor's report. Um, I have one item that uh, Mayor Barnett left us. This is uh, a application for a liquor license from the Marriott. The village has received an application for a Class H1 full alcohol on-premise consumption liquor license from Marriott Hotel Services, LLC, doing business as Marriott Suite Hotel, located at 1500 Opus Place. Pursuant to Section 3-12 of the Liquor Control Ordinance, a public hearing for a liquor license application may be waived. The application must be placed on file for a minimum of two weeks, subject to public comment prior to the issuance of a new license. At this time, I am placing these applications on file with the village clerk's office. Barring any objection, once the two-week waiting period has passed, liquor licenses shall be issued to Marriott Hotel Services, LLC, doing business as Marriott Suite Hotel, located at 1500 Opus Place. This is placed on file on this Tuesday, May the 9th, 2023. Item 12 on our agenda is council member reports. This is an opportunity for council members to report out on goings on in the community or um, any information they might have from other organizations in the community. I will start to my left with Commissioner Tully. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, just a few things. Uh, first of all, I just want to remind everyone that our very own uh, Hope's Front Door is holding their annual Hands of Hope luncheon on Tuesday, May 16th from 11.30 to 2 o'clock at Seven Bridges Golf Club, a great organization uh, that not only help the organization, but you can help your neighbors and help your community. Uh, second item is, uh, and someone may have already shared this before, so please excuse me if you're with me, but I haven't had a chance to, so I just wanted to uh, publicly recognize uh, our very own uh, Downers Grove Village Manager Dave Fieldman on receiving an honor from the Illinois Association of School Administrators for his contributions to the success of School District 58. I just have to read this quote from Dr. Russell. Uh, in addition to his role at the village, he is also a tremendous partner to the students, staff, and families of District 58. Uh, what an understatement. So congratulations, Dave, on that recognition. It's well deserved. And last, and this is only because I get to go before Commissioner Davenport, <laughs> there are in fact 44, 44 days. days. Yes. Rotary Grove, right? <laughs> thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Commissioner Gilmar. Yes, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, you will. Uh, hopefully give me some time here. There are a few things tonight that I want to address. Um, first and foremost, as we mark National Bicycle Month, it's an opportunity to not only celebrate the joys and benefits of cycling, but also to reflect on the broader social impact of bicycling throughout history, from promoting health and environmental sustainability to the empowering of women and marginalized communities. Bicycles have played a crucial role in fostering positive social change. Cycling offers numerous health benefits, both physically and mentally. Regular cycling has been shown to reduce the risk of heart disease by 50%, prevent, preventing obesity and type 2 diabetes, and decrease the risk of mortality by 28% for every 1,000 miles cycled. Environmentally, bicycles are champions of sustainability. They provide an eco-friendly alternative to motorized transport. By choosing to bike instead of driving, we can mitigate climate change and create greener urban and suburban spaces. The role of bicycles in social change cannot be understated. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, bicycles were instrumental in the women's emancipation movement. By offering women newfound independence, mobility, and a sense of empowerment, bicycles challenged societal norms, created uh, contributed to a shift in fashion toward more practical attire and fostered social connections that laid the groundwork for broader women's rights movement. Bicycles have also played a part in empowering minorities and marginalized communities. During the civil rights movement in the United States, bikes served as an accessible mode of transportation for activists registering black voters and attending civil rights events. In contemporary times, bicycles continue to offer economic empowerment and social mobility for low-income and minority populations.
by providing affordable access to education, jobs, and essential services. Economically, a well-developed cycling infrastructure can also boost local economies by attracting tourism and promoting a healthier, happier workforce. So as we celebrate National Bicycle Month, let's remember the far-reaching influence of bicycles from promoting physical and mental health to empowering women in marginalized communities. Bicycles have been proven to be a vital tool for creating more inclusive, sustainable, and just societies. I would also encourage us all to embrace the annual obs observation of Mental Health Awareness Month, a dedicated time to advocate for mental health education, support, and awareness. Mental health and mental illness is a complex, multi-strata public health issue, one that requires the attention, not unlike the attention we would give an epidemic, and one that affects a significant portion of the population. I want to thank the mayor for his proclamation tonight <clears throat> and our colleagues from last week who eloquently expressed the need for more focus on mental health. I do want to take this opportunity, though, to hone in on the importance of addressing mental health concerns among two specific demographics, the youth and our military personnel. According to the World Health Organization, half of all mental health conditions begin at the age of 14 but most cases go undetected and untreated. A, a 2021 study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association Pediatrics revealed that nearly one in five young people ages 13 to 18 in the United States experienced a mental health disorder in a given year. The same study indicated that the prevalence of anxiety and depression had increased 17 and 8% respectively from pre-pandemic levels. A lack of early intervention and treatment can lead to severe consequences, including increased risks of substance abuse, academic challenges, and self-harm. Alarmingly, suicide has become the second leading cause of death among individuals aged 10 to 34 yep. in the United States. And the rate of suicide for LGBTQ teens is four times that of the demographic's general population. Attempts are 12 times. And to be clear, the research shows the cause of this disproportion is not inherent to sexual orientation or gender identity, but based on minority stress, the anxiety and depression caused mm -hmm. by being mistreated, stigmatized, and marginalized. These staggering statistics demonstrate the urgency to address mental health among our young population. In addition to the young, military personnel are another group that face unique mental health challenges. The stressors associated with military service, such as deployment, exposure to traumatic events, and the physical demands of training, significantly, significantly contribute to mental health disorders. A 2021 report by the Department of Defense revealed that nearly one in four active duty service members had experienced mental health disorder. Furthermore, that same report disclosed that the suicide rate among active duty military personnel had increased by 25% from 2019 to 2020, reaching a record high. The suicide rate for military personnel is double that of the general population. And while these statistics are daunting, the positive news is that mental health awareness has gained momentum in recent years. There are more and more resources available now Groups like NAMI and GRIT2, who you heard from tonight, and many groups are dedicated to providing support, education, and advocacy for individuals and families affected by mental health conditions. And while we have still a long way to go, it's encouraging to hear from my fellow commissioners and the mayor statements of support. These statements are indication that the stigma around discussing and addressing mental health is waning, but it's more than talk. We as a village took a big step in what I hope will be a growing effort to help by hiring a full-time social worker that continues to be an invaluable resource to the members of our community. If you or someone you care about needs help and you don't know where to start, please reach out to Heather at 630-434-6894. All communication will be confidential. Also, last year, DuPage County launched 211 a free confidential information and referral service that provides a central access point 
to local health and human services. You can call 211 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And for those in crisis, 988 is a national suicide prevention hotline. You can call, you can text or chat to this confidential hotline and speak with trained professionals. And this is not just for those in crisis, but also for those who may know someone in crisis, but may not be sure what to do. So as we commemorate Mental Health Awareness Month, let us remember the importance of acknowledging, understanding, and supporting mental health for everyone, especially for the young and military populations. And let us recognize those who are working to help make a difference. By fostering awareness, we can help change the narrative surrounding mental health and create a society where everyone has access to the support they need. Oftentimes at the front lines of this battle for better mental health are, are our nurses. So it's important that we, ce we celebrate National Nurses Week this week as well. Let us take a moment to recognize and salute the incredible work of our nurses who are, who are the backbone of our healthcare system. These dedicated professionals work tirelessly on the front lines, lines, saving countless lives and improving the overall health of our community. Nurses play a critical role in that community, providing care and support for thousands of patients locally each year. Global nurses and midwives form the largest segment of healthcare professionals. Studies show that increasing the number of nurses can result in significant reduction in patient mortality. In fact, a 10% increase in the nursing workforce is associated with a 7% reduction in patient deaths. Nurses not only save lives through their skilled interventions, but also contribute to the prevention of diseases and the promotion of overall wellness. They act as patient advocates, educators, and crucial members of interdisciplinary healthcare teams. Their expertise and empathy make a lasting impact on patients and their families. This Nurses Week, let us honor the exceptional contribution of all of our nurses. We express our deepest gratitude to those selfless individuals who dedicate their lives to healing, comforting, and improving the lives of others. Thank you, nurses, for your unwavering commitment and for making our world a healthier and safer place. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Davenport. Yes. Um, Fortunately, I have some sad news to share. Um, uh, last night, a uh, senior at uh, Downer South passed away. Um, and his name is Eugene Johnson. And so um, we should keep Eugene and uh, Eugene's family, uh, friends, coaches, teachers, um, in our thoughts and prayers. So. Thank you. No report. Thank you, Mayor Proton. Thank you. Commissioner Stowski, if you could. Well, Commissioner uh, Gilmore, I'm still a little bit of thunder. So for, for those who don't know, my, my day job is actually at the American Hospital Association, and I work in our clinical affairs and workforce division. So I want to echo all of the sentiments about National Nurses Week. Um, they really are, are critical for patient care and for well-being and have unfortunately faced a rising level of incivility and violence, as we've seen in a lot of our service organizations. Um, so, you know, we need to also be caring for our caregivers and, and thinking about their mental health as well because our clinicians also face almost a, a double rate of, of suicide um, as the general population. So I um, want to wish happy National Nurses Week to all of our nurses and thank you for the hard work that you do. It's also actually National Hospital Week, so thank you to Advocate Good Sam for being you know, our, one of our, our biggest employers and a re really critical part to our community. Um, I do actually want to mention, um, I wasn't going to, but it made me think of it as Commissioner Gilmartin was talking. We actually do have a new People Matter, Words Matter poster that is really geared towards clinicians and hospitals, but could also be used for others. That is really about reducing the stigma and stigmatizing language around mental health struggles for children and adolescents. So if anybody has any interest in that, you are always welcome to reach out to me, um, and I can, I can link you up with, with those resources. Um, I am going to bring it up a little bit for our LGBTQIA plus community and um, share some really good news from Equality Downers Grove, also known as EQDG. And they're excited to share that they're partnering with the Downers Grove Public Library to bring the Legacy Wall to the library in June 2023 to coincide with Pride Month. For those who don't know, the Legacy Wall is a traveling educational installation created by the Leg Legacy Project Chicago. Now, uh, you may be familiar with the Legacy Walk on Halstead Street in Chicago, which was, you know, the first created. It's, the wall is an interactive digital 
24 foot by 8 foot installation that showcases biographies of famous individuals from the LGBTQIA plus community. They, the biographies span 400 years of contribu contributions by people who just happen to be LGBTQIA+. The intention is to educate people about scientists, inventors, leaders, and people in the arts, all walks of life, about the contributions that they have made to society globally. So EQDG is currently fundraising for this exhibit in an attempt to raise $10,000 by hopefully mid-May, so this month, to bring the legacy wall to the western suburbs where it has never been displayed. So if you're interested, you can donate to the cause at eqdg.org slash donate. And if you want more information about the legacy wall, you can go to legacyprojectchicago.org slash legacy dash wall. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. I would just like to remind folks that uh, the first Downers, uh, downtown Downers Grove market is this Saturday, and we will be joining it at 9 o'clock for coffee with the council. So if you have any uh, comments or questions you'd like to, to send along to us, we hope to see you there. With that, uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Mayor Pro Tem, I move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>